Welcome everyone. Yes. Today's yes. session is uh, on Africa's capacity for real-time uh, polymerase chain reaction, a uh, diagnosis of infectious diseases. And we are very grateful to all our speakers and to you, our attendees who are here today. On that note, then uh, I would uh, like to introduce myself uh, just a little. My name is Palma Masumbe Netongo, and I am a Work Package 5 leader uh, for ALERT. And today I'll be handing over then the platform uh, to Dr. John Amwasi. And John Amwasi is uh, uh, from Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. He's a senior lecturer at the Department of Global Health. He is uh, in the School of Public Health. He is also the head of the Department for Community Health in the School of Medicine and Dentistry. He is the leader for uh, the Global Health and Infectious Disease Group in Kumasi, uh, Collaborative Center for Research in Tropical Disease, KCCR, which is heavily represented here today. He's also adjunct professor in the University of Minnesota in public, for public health in uh, the USA. He's executive director for the research uh, network for neglected tropical diseases. And of course, he is the co-chair of the Lancet One Health Commission. But today I think he would like to keep his casket of uh, alert uh, uh, Africa uh, uh, clinical characterization for COVID-19 uh, lead, uh, a project that is sponsored by the Wellcome Trust for uh, 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 alert. And he will be assisted in this task by Professor Penlap, who uh, I think has just joined Penlap Veronique is a full professor of biochemistry in the University of Yaounde One, somebody that we don't really need to present anymore. And she's uh, the country representative for uh, CANTAM, the Central African Network for Tuberculosis, uh, AIDS and Malaria. She's also country representative for uh, ALERT. And she's uh, partnering uh, uh, somehow with uh, Pandora. These are two sister networks. Uh, for sponsored by EDCTP. And so I'll leave the two of them to then uh, take over the session and uh, I'll welcome myself back as a speaker. John and Veronique, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Palmer. Um, and also would like to acknowledge uh, my co-chair, Professor uh, Penn Lab. Um, yeah. it's, it's nice to be with you. As you know, I'll be taking care of this first part, and then we'll hand over um, to, to Prof Penlop uh, to take over from there. Um, we have a, an exciting array for this afternoon um, with you. Uh, we will be delving into RT-PCR capacity, and I will just share a few uh, slides with you on alert. But um, we have four speakers who are lined up uh, for this first part. And then we'll enter into a panel discussion. Um, and then afterwards, um, you'll be able to take some questions. But I'm also hoping that we could spare some five minutes after the first panel discussion just to take your questions as they come through um, in, in the panel discussion. Uh, so do, do be fielding your questions as and when the presenters come on so we can aggregate these and um, be able to feed them into the panel. Um, discussion. Um, so we'd have a first presentation from uh, Dr. Umu Magas Kofare, who is the uh, principal investigator for the ASAP consortium um, here in Ghana, which, which actually is a sponsor for the, for, for the ASAP consortium. It's a large consortium uh, looking at a triple therapy for anti-malarials. It's funded by EDCTP as well. Um, pretty cutting edge and exciting uh, work that Umu is leading. She's also a co-investigator for ALET um, here at KCCR, and we work very closely on the FISA study. In fact, she uh, directly uh, manages uh, the FISA study at our site at Asinfosu. Um, she uh, comes from a, a rich background of uh, training in parastology um, and also has a lot of experience dealing with PCR She's actually an in-house PCR uh, troubleshooter or expert um, here at the KCCR. And so what she will present uh, will be coming from a wealth of uh, personal knowledge and experience and relevance uh, to the field. 
I would also like to make a very specific mention of uh, my own uh, colleague, uh, Palmer, who is um, leading this. Um, so uh, Palmer um, is an assistant professor of biology at the Navajo Technical University in the US. Uh, he studied at the University of Yaoundé and he worked there um, in, since, since 2011. Uh, he had time spent at WHO TDR. I remember we met there uh, several years ago. He founded the Molokai Diagnostic Research Group within the Biotechnology Center at the uh, University of Yaoundé One. I mean, I could go on and on and on. He's, re he's won several grants, including uh, with the EDCTP and with the Grant Challenges Canada. Um, and he also volunteers as the executive secretary of the Initiative to Strengthen Health Research Capacity in Africa, Ichereka, among several other hats that he wears. But as he mentioned for the purposes of this webinar, he is um, really uh, the lead for the Work Package 5 um, together with Bonnie, um, who's also um, coordinating this. Um, Dr. Colin Zotieno also is, is no stranger to uh, those of us in the research field, and particularly those of you who play in the lab, if I'll put it that way. Uh, so he's the principal investigator, um, or actually the project lead of um, the African Society for Laboratory Medicine. And we know there's a very critical association in Africa, uh, perhaps highly relevant in these times in which we live uh, for really coordinating um, promoting uh, the, the strength of laboratory capacity across the uh, continent, and particularly today as we discuss um, PCR, um, perhaps no better person to speak to uh, the relevance of, of the ASLM and uh, how the ASLM is really playing a critical role in um, these COVID days, particularly liaison with the Africa CDC, and with the WHO Afro and several other uh, regional bodies across the continent to bring um, Africa's capacity to bear and also to uh, find means and ways of improving um, this. Also coming to us will be um, Professor Rosa Peeling, who's professor and chair of the uh, Diagnostics and the Diagnostic Research Director of the International Diagnostics Center at the London School of Hygiene and tropical medicine. I'm sure we've all read a lot about uh, Professor Peeling and, and the work that she has uh, done and the contribution she's made, uh, not only in the UK, but globally uh, to diagnostics, um, especially for um, infectious diseases. Uh, and we are really, really pleased uh, to have uh, Professor Peeling with us and she'll be speaking very specifically on sustainable biobanking networks in Africa. Uh, I'm cognizant of the time, and so um, if I can have the screen sharing rights, I will just very quickly um, share uh, just maybe two slides on uh, alert, and then uh, we will take it from there. I just want to confirm that I do have um, these slides available. Yes, I do. So alert is the African Coalition for Epidemic uh, Research Response and Training, which is a multidisciplinary consortium really focused on uh, providing research uh, in epidemics uh, to support clinical care. So not just research in a vacuum, but we recognize the cardinal role that research plays in epidemics. Of course, ALET was founded as part of uh, the responses to the Ebola crisis, uh, and it couldn't have come at a better time uh, than, than now in these COVID days, and ALET um, it involves 21 partner organizations um, in Europe and in Africa, nine in Africa, four in Europe, as represented by all the logos that you can see um, on your screen. It is EDCTP funded and also supported by the UK um, National Institutes for Health Research. Um, this is the distribution of alert uh, teams and partners across uh, Europe and, and in Africa. Then there are several other affiliates. Um, so we always like to argue that Alet's footprint really stretches across the entire continent. And we work very closely um, with the sister network Pandora, which is also uh, funded by the 
ADCTP. Uh, because of time, I will stop here, but just to mention that currently Alert is engaged in um, uh, running uh, clinical characterization, the cl clinical characterization protocol for COVID in a number of African countries, including Senegal, Ghana, Cameroon, Uganda, Kenya, expanding now into Guinea and to the DRC, and looking forward to add many more um, um, uh, countries uh, to this work. So with this, I will I like to stop and just get into the subject matter for today, which is um, you know RT PCR. Um, for diagnosis of infectious disease. And I'd like to uh, go ahead and ask um, our first speaker today to load up and I can see she's fired up, ready to go. And she's gonna speak about the need for RT-PCR in addressing emerging infectious diseases in Africa. So over to you, Dr. Umu Maiga Skofari. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and uh, the opportunity also to uh, talk today. So um, I will uh, talk uh, today about the need of uh, uh, so the need of RT PCR capacity in Africa uh, to address emerging infectious diseases. So just to add on on the presentation that John has made of me, I'm actually came to KCCR uh, during the Ebola outbreak to actually train um, uh, local staff on uh, real-time PCR to detect Ebola. So um, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to uh, share my experience on that uh, today. Yes, what is the, the first, I will talk about the impact of re-emergent infectious disease in, on, in Africa. Um, we know that the international bodies working in health, like uh, the, including the WHO, constantly express the concern regarding Africa's high vulnerability to the threat of pandemics. Uh, these concerns have run up in a number of factors, including uh, continuing human intrusion of, uh, uh, in the virgin rainforest on other animal habitats. Also the absence or severe porosity of disease uh, surveillance such uh, surveillance system uh, which easily allow epidemics to seed on getting out of control. Also the weakness um, in the health system, which are unable to cope with providing care for person who might fall in ill from emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases. Uh, the continued dependency of African economics on the extra um, extractive industry and the extreme vol uh, volatility of these economics to external shocks without effective uh, cautioning mechanism. Uh, we can also uh, talk about the pre-existing uh, civil unrest uh, which mitigates against uh, otherwise simple or effective disease control interventions. So um, we know that in Africa, uh, epidemics emerge uh, at regular intervals across the continent and uh, stay maybe uh, and not spread beyond Africa. So over, over the past five years, we have uh, had to deal with Ebola viruses diseases, uh, Lassa fevers, yellow fever, uh, monkeypox uh, epidemics and the plague, just to name a few. And, um, uh, those uh, repetitive uh, epidemics um, uh, bring a, a lot of burden on the continent. Just to name few, we have um, recently uh, overcome the Ebola um, growth frontal globally with the high mortality. Many countries uh, at that time uh, had a restriction on traveling from the most uh, affected countries like to name Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone. Also, uh, the airline canceled a flight uh, to part of Africa in several activities involving traveling between Africa and the rest of the world, even though some of the uh, countries were not affected um, in Africa. Uh, also to mention um, a disease like uh, missile that remains endemic and um, cyclical in tropical Africa, recording high incidence peaks during the dry season. 
uh, between 2019 and 2020 uh, at the DRC. Uh, has recorded over uh, 6,000 uh, deaths and uh, 310,000 uh, suspected cases. Uh, I will just talk also about uh, meningitis epidemics that um, um, strike around the sub-Saharan Africa meningitis belt, extending from um, uh, Senegal in the West Africa to Ethiopia in the East Africa every eight to 10 uh, years with uh, some communities reporting a um, uh, continuous uh, a rate of uh, one under uh, one two hundred. So what are the challenges with the diagnostic capacity in Africa? Um, I'm pretty sure everybody is aware of those uh, challenges, but I will just uh, name a few. Uh, we know that first the resource limitations and the cost effectiveness of uh, av available diagnostics. Um, the long uh, turnaround time for available diagnostic are not uh, useful for containment and management of infectious diseases outbreak or enable to support real-time evaluation of the efficacy of uh, medical interventions. And typically um, this is happening when we are deal with off-label use of experimental use of drugs for emerging infectious diseases without uh, knowing curve. Um, also, we have the over-reliance of clinical diagnosis without laboratory confirmation. Uh, several infectious diseases with high asymptomatically and non-specific symptoms like COVID-19 or malaria. Also, the influx of in in approved diagnostic, mostly with very low sensitive and specific. So the use of the RT-PCR in disease management and uh, research is uh, in Africa is actually well documented and we have a few publication uh, to show it. Some, for example, uh, to detect uh, schistosoma or uh, Oncarcerca volvovet. But also very recently, uh, the increase of um, uh, detection of Ebola viruses in, um, in uh, West Africa uh, during the, the last outbreak. But as at uh, February 2020, um, RT-PCR diagnostic capacity was uh, uh, very limited in, uh, in Africa, as we know, with uh, actually only 40 of the 55 African countries were able to uh, mention one to three um, qualified testing laboratories and the remaining 15 uh, did not have the capacity. But we can maybe uh, say that we have to thank uh, the COVID-19 pandemic where uh, a great effort from the African Union has been made uh, to equip uh, the 55 uh, countries in RT-PCR. In, in, uh, in so we know mainly um, what is the, the, the reason of, of um, um, the lack of, of, um, of um, the issue of limiting um, having um, the capacities in Africa is first the, the lack of infrastructure, but also the lack of uh, training laboratory and staff, the expensive and high maintenance of cost of the machines, and also uh, the difficulties of uh, having available and accessible regions. We usually in a research setting uh, rely, rely on our um, uh, European or American partners to provide those regions. So what is the rele relevance of uh, having RT-PCR for uh, infectious diagnosis uh, in Africa? is first it will improve the sensitivity and the specificity of um, the diagnostic but also have a fast turnaround from uh, other um, uh, tools that we have in place improve the infectious disease outbreak management and epidemic preparedness uh, provide a gold standard diagnostic um, in a resource limited environment that also um, be able to be uh, reproducible. Um, also uh, have a cost effectiveness um, that needs to be taken into account. The feasibility of 
doing research during emerging infectious diseases also is very important. Uh, some um, research could be focused on characterization of emerging infectious disease, uh, the pathogen itself, uh, the, the, the determination of uh, the prevalence or the transmission pattern, uh, uh, performing some uh, uh, pathogen genomics and um, to uh, identify, for example, the variants, um, disease susceptibility markers, and also um, identifying some uh, molecular markers for uh, resistance uh, from the pathogen. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we do that, uh, we acknowledge uh, that there's some challenging in um, uh, establishing RT-PCR in Africa. Um, first, in the general uh, sense of having laboratory diagnostic in Africa, uh, one of the issues um, that everybody might uh, be aware of is uh, maybe the stability of the electricity, for example. But there's also some uh, specific challenges concerning PCR. Uh, as we know, the PCR is a multi-step uh, and also a very intensive process uh, to get a result. And uh, it can um, bring a huge backlog due to the limited capacity uh, when we are facing uh, mass testing and um, also uh, conduct to um, slow down the detection of suspected cases. And just to give an example, uh, at KCCR, which was um, uh, one of the two centers at the beginning of uh, the pandemic of COVID to uh, perform um, the testing. At one point, in the, we were at uh, 10,000 uh, samples behind. And uh, this has taken uh, a lot of time and uh, needs of um, training and huge capacity building in a very short period of time to be able to uh, overcome this uh, backlog. Also, we have the distance uh, between infrastructure and the points of care uh, where the samples are actually collected, uh, usually very far from uh, uh, the PCR facilities and also the mode of transportation that can be very difficult um, uh, to bring the samples to the testing center and maybe uh, bring some loss of uh, sample integrity. Also, the need of uh, specific infrastructure like uh, the level two or level three cabinet and uh, different rooms for the different step of uh, the expression and master mix and amplification of the PCR. So just to finish, um, why it is very critical to build uh, PCR capacity in, uh, in Africa. Uh, this actually will really help uh, um, reinforce the research infrastructure and being able to uh, bring um, uh, move the the um, the competency up. Uh, it also bring a, a, an immense prospect for rapid decrease in morbidity and mor uh, mortality for those uh, infectious diseases, as uh, it will improve the surveillance and the clinical care. And we can refer to the impact of uh, installing uh, gene spec, uh, the, the gene expert uh, across um, countries and continents for uh, surveillance of the tuberculosis. It also brings uh, economic opportunities and saving from uh, losses caused by the epidemics, the morbidity and the mortality. And it's a basic also step uh, to uh, be able to bring sequencing capacity in Africa uh, we have now a huge demand of uh, being able to do so that such a sequencing because we see, for example, for the COVID, the different variants uh, need to be tested. Uh, with that, I, I wish to thank um, uh, everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Maiga, for introducing us to the relevance of uh, RT-PCR um, in Africa, particularly for emerging infectious diseases. I particularly like what you mentioned in the end about how this really dovetails into another diagnostic capacity for which there is serious lack across the continent, which is um, for uh, sequencing. But of course, it would be very difficult to ramp up sequencing capacity when we don't even have 
RT-PCR capacity sorted out. It is, it is actually refreshing to see uh, from, from you know, the, the statement you quoted in the paper in the Lancet by uh, Dr. Nkenga Song at the Africa CDC regarding the numbers of countries that had RT-PCRs at February 2020. And to think that now every single country in Africa has to some degree uh, this capacity, also recognizing how this capacity is strongly linked to research and how countries that had uh, research centers in place were able to ramp up much more quickly uh, than those that did not. So really thank you for bringing these to the fore. Um, uh, we move on to our next presentation. We are so perfectly on time and I'm hopefully that, hopeful we'll, we'll be able to maintain this trajectory. Uh, I'd like to hand over to uh, Dr. Natongo, uh, Professor Natongo for that matter, uh, who is gonna to speak to us about co-primer um, uh, technology of real-time PCR uh, and exactly what it is, and not just what it is, but what it is not. So um, just hold to your seats and Palmer, you take over. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, John. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Chair, for this opportunity again to share uh, with uh, you what the co-primer can do. And yeah, I'm not surprised when uh, Umu is mentioning that this is the time to get gene expert to all over the place. Yes, that's what we know, but I'm going to share to you that today the co-primer is offering even better opportunities for our poor settings. But yes, I keep my casket of work package five leader for alert. And what we are doing today is of course, trying to do what we do best which is generally, basically, uh, sorry, you know, trying to build capacity and today we'll be doing that uh, for the co-primer. So I have a couple of uh, 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 proprietary slides from co-diagnostics because co-diagnostics is the company that uh, uh, makes uh, uh, co-primer and has that patent. And I'm very grateful to Marius picture I put here because she helped from co-diagnostics and of uh, uh, the spectrum to put uh, these slides together. And so what we do best is alert and work package five, which is the training uh, arm of alert is to enhance capacity and make sure that that capacity is able to be maintained for an operational research uh, in Africa, especially during uh, emergencies for a good quality of our network. And we also try to make sure that we provide these capacity uh, hands-on in terms of training and providing uh, development for this capacity, but ensuring above all that, even after the funding runs out for alert, we have this capacity in place ready for these uh, epidemics. We have been taken a little aback by COVID because we were not maybe particularly ready, but hopefully it's also giving us a chance to do even uh, better. So today, this is what we are trying to do, uh, building capacity for real-time PCR diagnosis. And again, this is just uh, you know, following up the call from uh, Dr. John Kengasman of Africa CDC that uh, ahead of the second wave of COVID-19, he was basically calling that we need to adjust testing ahead of this second wave. And I think uh, African uh, Society for Laboratory Medicine, which is heavily represented here also, uh, was the first to pick up that call and launch the COVID-19 ACO sessions. And I have particularly been interested in following those sessions. And I'm always referring people to go back and look at session 24 and 33, because these are very relevant to the topic that we are discussing today. And Umu had already mentioned turnaround time for real-time uh, PCR diagnostic results. That has been a major problem with uh, this current pandemic, uh, 24 hours, uh, more than 24 hours, sometimes even up to seven days in some settings, like in Cameroon, where we are now running the uh, uh, alert CCP for the Africa uh, Clinical Characterization Protocol. We are realizing that some centers are really having difficulties getting their results uh, from the uh, central laboratory. And this, uh, uh, statement is just from the Minister of uh, Health in uh, uh, Ghana, who was saying that we need more testing labs to be established because, you know, testing is not commensurate with the growing demand for COVID-19 as it is. Uh, 
And so basically what I'm presenting today is the co-primer uh, technology to basically answer these uh, four questions, uh, what it is and uh, what advantages they have over the conventional methods, Cyber Green and Tartman, and uh, how they are able to reduce one of the major headaches that we have in uh, PCR, which is the formation of primer uh, dimers. And of course, how uh, this technology can be used uh, to eliminate the need for uh, a melting curve analysis, which is what we usually want to use uh, to correct some of our problems that we have with uh, cyber grid. And so this is the outline that I'm going to follow for this talk. Uh, basically starting to present what uh, the co-diagnostic is because they hold a patent for this. And I'm very thankful that, you know, they could allow me to use this uh, uh, patent. They own their patent, they own their platform. So it's very easy for co-diagnostics to then be able to provide this very low cost and highly effective uh, diagnostic testing uh, for all of us and adapt that to the needs. And they, so they see themselves as a company that was basically set up to attend to these uh, uh, areas where uh, these diseases are more prevalent. And we were, uh, at the time there was no COVID, but uh, diagnosis uh, uh, was geared especially towards uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So yes, with this technology, you can be able to adequately uh, detect uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis to Zika and dengue uh, virus, uh, chikungunya, malaria, HPV, HIV. And of course they have a very huge platform for mosquito surveillance. So for those who are interested, uh, they can get uh, that. And many more tests can be developed. So for those of you interested, the uh, co-diagnostic scientific team is really willing to work with people in adjusting and developing new test platforms. So it's a, a company that has a listening eye, a ear to a, a scientists on the ground. And I think focus right now is in Africa, reason why I'm talking to you uh, about this technology, because the, the aim is to really get to deploy it. And they uh, have uh, understood that uh, uh, cost can be a problem. So they've adopted this uh, nice little uh, PCR machine here, the MIC. And so these thermocycler, which can run 48 samples, uh, well, 46 with two controls, if you like, uh, is uh, very handy because as I'll show you later on, it's very, very uh, affordable machine. And uh, the company, of course, they are located in Salt Lake City. And this is what just the company looks like. And so what is real-time PCR that we know? We know, of course, that uh, polymerase chain reaction in itself was uh, this vision from Carrie Mollis, uh, who was rewarded by his Nobel Prize in 1993 for chemistry. And these methods we know have been used to you know, produce millions uh, to billions of uh, specific copies of uh, nucleic acid uh, in a particular sample and very quickly too. And so uh, real-time is just basically uh, because uh, from the Karimoli's uh, 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 way of looking at things, we had to do this process and then do a gel and then observe the gel and analyze it with sometimes uh, uh, chemicals that uh, were not very appropriate for us. But in real time now, what it happens is that you can be able to track the progress of your reaction in real time. And because you can either use DNA or RNA, when you are using RNA, then there is a step that you need to uh, involved in it for reverse transcriptase. And so when it's real-time reverse transcriptase PCR, as is the case for COVID-19, then you will have to use uh, uh, RNA as a template for that. And so uh, how does PCR work? We know from this textbook uh, manual that it involves uh, basically four components. Uh, you need a DNA template, I'll call it a nucleic acid template because it could also be RNA. And uh, you need, uh, of course, the polymerase. And if you're doing uh, R, uh, reverse transcriptase, then you need uh, this enzyme reverse transcriptase. You need your primers, you need your nucleotides. And most of the time we are told you need these primers in excess, but as you see, when we start looking at the cyber green, then that becomes a problem which needs to be corrected. And so the process itself goes through these steps, basically uh, a denaturation step, then of course, 
in the cycling, uh, you have a first denaturation, and then an annealing step and an extension step, which is what is represented here in this diagram. And then of course, a final extension before you can get your products. And so uh, <clears throat> if you zoom into that process, what is basically happening is that in the denaturation, you have then your uh, 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 DNA template that opens up for the primers to be able to anneal uh, five prime and three prime. And these primers then get uh, elongated by addition of these uh, DNTPs to form these new strands. And in real time, what you actually would be seeing would be uh, this curve right here, having these four portions. There is one portion here for the background that is really not just represented in this particular diagram. But then you have this exponential phase where you have expected to see, uh, you know, an exponential addition of uh, uh, the products that you amplify before it hits this linear phase. And then of course it gets to plateau when the materials are of course being used. And so what the co-primer is then, introducing the co-primer at this stage, I want to really uh, uh, take time to say that, you know, for a real-time PCR uh, reaction, as I'll show you in the other two slides for what uh, the co-primer is not, for the co-primer, you would have uh, to get a primer sequence, this part here, which is the blue part. But the primer sequence, uh, as you will see, unlike in uh, you know, the other real-time PCR uh, uh, sequences, uh, reactions that I'll show you, is linked to a capture sequence. And that is linked through this uh, uh, linker here, which is basically made up of adenine and uh, polyethylene glycol. The fact that it is made of adenine and polyethylene glycol is actually the basis of this uh, 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 co-primer technology to kind of increase its uh, specificity and ensuring that you are not able to form those primer dimers. But what uh, this uh, primer has as a specific uh, uh, to it is that the capture sequence is quite long compared to the primer sequence. And the primer sequence is uh, very short that in a normal reaction in an open system, normally this primer will not be able to bind. So it uses this uh, binding uh, of the uh, capture sequence, which is very high because this uh, uh, melting temperature here is completely different from this one. And the capture sequence will then sit first. And by binding DNA, it is able now to uh, pull uh, this DNA to a coiling position that makes the primer sequence to be in very close proximity, which would then increase the binding ability to about 10,000 times, which means that even though this primer in a normal open reaction would not be able to bind, because this sequence is binding, it brings this primer and gives it a very high ability to be able to specifically bind to its target. So once that binding happened for the primer, that is when extension starts. And what you will notice down here is that the extension process is actually taking away uh, the, uh, the capture sequence. And by destroying this capture sequence, it uh, tells you already that you can therefore attach that pair of quencher and fluorophore to this section of the primer for the capture sequence and be able to achieve the same thing that you achieve with uh, a probe in uh, uh, a Tachman uh, uh, reaction. So this whole sequence makes uh, the co-primer uh, a very important tool that uh, you, know, you can use and adapt to uh, many, many different kinds of PCR reactions as I'll show in the next slide. So in this next slide, I'm just basically showing that because of that high ability of binding of the capture sequence, there is an increased specificity for the primer. There is therefore uh, elimination of the primer dimer. And I have uh, two slides that I'm going to discuss this again further. And because in a traditional uh, PCR uh, primer, what you would see happening is that you would have the formation of uh, primer dimer once uh, the, you have a complementarity between uh, say the five prime end of one primer and the three prime end of the other primer. 
And these primers, this primer dimers, once they form, they just uh, you know, continue multiplying because then the amplification goes on. But with the co-primers I'll show in this next slide, once that kind of binding happens, even if it does happen, the co-primer is able to stop that amplification because you cannot have extension go through this uh, inert uh, linker sequence. Because this uh, uh, polyethylene glycol is an inhibitor of extension of polymerase. So it will not be able to allow uh, primer dimer to continue forming. And that cycle of formation of primer dimer would be uh, immediately interrupted. So this gives uh, you know, the co-primer its very huge ability then that you can use it, you can be able to multiplex it without any fear because as you realize most of the time, even if you have to reduce uh, the primer concentration to be able to adjust and correct for primer dimer formation, then you have an issue when you come to multiplexing because there you have many, many primers and the tendency is that you may have one or two that are complementary uh, to one another at a particular end. So this co-primer technology really takes that worry out of the way and allows you then the potential to be able to multiplex. And so this brings me to what then the co-primer is not, which is you know, the traditional uh, uh, PCR, real-time PCR that you know. And so Takman, we know of course, is that you need a primer, you need a probe specifically, uh, and these two have to be synthesized for each target that you're looking for. And the probe carries the quencher and the fluorophore, which are kept in tight uh, 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 proximity. And of course, during the amplification, once the primer binds to its correct sequence, and then the probe, of course, to its correct sequence, then that eliminates, uh, destroys this uh, probe. And then, of course, the fluorophore is released from the quencher, and then you start seeing fluorescence. And of course, accumulation of fluorescence is just translated to more PCR products in your mix. And this is very specific, but remember that you have to synthesize a primer and a probe differently compared to the co-primer where you only need a forward primer and a reverse primer. You don't need an extra synthesis for a probe. So already that can give you an idea to say that in terms of pricing, the co-primer is way affordable to make than this Tagman, which for now is the reference. So you can already see the co-primer really taking central stage here. And of course, if we go to the very first uh, uh, cyber green method or intercalating dye methods, which we know, basically in this one, as uh, PCR is evolving, then it, the intercalation of this dye, which intercalates everything that is double-stranded DNA, is going to fluoresce and show up a signal. And lighting up would not matter even if your primer is uh, mismatched is not amplifying the right sequence, you will still see fluorescence because all that this uh, dye does is that it binds uh, you know, double-stranded DNA. So today we know that it's not only cyber green, we have other methods that are there, uh, but all of these still need this uh, correction, which I mentioned about melt curves. So melt curves are useful because then you can use this melting temperatures for this, uh, 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 primers to be able to look at the specificity of the product that you've amplified in terms of its length. And then of course, you can tell that the product that you're having in there is the correct product rather than a, a false uh, product, which will give you a false positive if uh, the, the target that you're looking for was not there. But as you can imagine with everything that is cyber grain, it's very hard to multiplex that because you cannot really have many more than one pair of primers sitting in there. And so I mentioned that, yes, the cost is a problem. And I'm just putting this slide up here, which I'll run through basically uh, because uh, my uh, Umu has really touched on this. You will need a sample. You need to transport that to a central lab, which will have one of these big uh, machines. And I'm just uh, putting the quotes here which are prices that I got from uh, the websites of these uh, various companies, just to show what it compares with, with this uh, little uh, uh, preference here from Code Diagnostics. $14,000 compared to all of these prices, as you can tell, there is really no uh, match for that. But for all of these, you still need trained personnel. And this is why we are here today 
trying to see how we can build, but above all, sustain this capacity for a real-time PCR. Because today we have COVID, we don't know what is coming next. It may still come while we are still around. So we think that it is important to then uh, send out these kinds of messages and put this uh, uh, co uh, code DX box, the code diagnostic box, uh, where you know we cannot get these heavy machines uh, to uh, like in our peripheric labs. And the one good thing with the code DX box also is the fact that you know you can connect up to ten machines. Uh, to one computer and run them remotely. And so that is also something that, you know, uh, it's uh, very advantageous because we can use that in many ways to, you know, impact how we fight uh, emerging infections. And so the core primer technology, therefore, what I can uh, say is that it is able to be used to implement a wide range of disciplines that, uh, you know, and it can be used to increase the speed, lower the cost, uh, enhance the accuracy of every kind of detection that you want for every uh, uh, infectious disease. So as I was saying, we don't know what's coming next, but you can do this with a peace of mind that you have increased uh, specificity and above all the accuracy is very, very uh, uh, important. And the next thing that uh, you have as an advantage with the co-primer is that because uh, the patents are uh, owned by this company, which has that vision to really serve uh, uh, poor communities, then they are able to get uh, the development quickly for all the molecular diagnostic tools that you need based on this technology and this platform. And so deployability would be something that we would uh, expect would come also very quickly. Now, the unique uh, capability of this uh, uh, system in allowing it to multiplex many, many uh, 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 targets at the same time would allow you also to use that high specificity to be able to detect even single nucleotide polymorphisms. And so it makes that detection easy for all kinds of diseases, including uh, cancer targets. So artificial intelligence is something that we should uh, be able to uh, uh, reckon with these days. And this technology is actually making use of that to ensure that, you know, by uh, able to, by being able to link up their machines, you can use artificial intelligence to really get uh, all of your uh, development phase, uh, for instance, for the new targets that they wish uh, to get uh, to be very fast. And I think the scientific team in code diagnostics is a team to reckon with because you would see that in just a very short time, they've been able to come up with a, a, large, a huge plethora of tests and many others are in the development pipeline. And as I mentioned already at the beginning, if you are called to provide input, please gladly do so because the team listens to you as experts on the field to be able to develop their new uh, test. And so the reagents, the components that you need, the PCR thermocycler, the CODEX box, uh, all are fedable and they are able to be deployed at uh, your request. And I have a, a last slide that uh, gives addresses where you can get that to. And so here, I think our goal is just to say that this is a technology that can serve worldwide uh, market and it's uh, a superior technology, but also a very, very affordable technology. I know 15 minutes is short, I will be able to take questions. And if I cannot respond to those questions that you have, you can always reach out to the scientific team in CODEX represented uh, on this slide here by Madi Stack, who helped me put the slides together. And then of course, anything that you have or need on the continent uh, can be supplied directly uh, by talking to uh, the uh, global uh, sales manager, uh, Denny Crockett from co-diagnostics. And of course, I am uh, your humble servant who is able to help at any time serving as a consultant for this. Thank you so much for listening and I will take your questions. Thanks, Chair. Over. Uh, thank you very much, Palmer. Uh, we will, what we'll do is that we'll move on to the other two presentations and then we'll take questions from there so that we can stay um, within our time frame.
So I'd like uh, to move to, uh, to you, Dr. Um, Otieno Odhiambo. And as I introduce, you are the project lead for the African Society for Laboratory Medicine, uh, particularly the lab uh, COP, um, the lab community of practice project. So critical that we have um, capacity and uh, methods streamlined across the continent um, in order to really bolster the capacity to deliver um, uh, diagnostics uh, towards uh, emerging infectious diseases. So really the relevance of ESLM coming out so strong in these times. So uh, Dr. Odihambo, thank you so much. And we look forward to your presentation over to you. Yeah, so thanks to the event organizers for inviting me to share on the Laboratory Community of Practice, uh, which is one of the projects at the African Society for Laboratory Medicine. ASLM was established in 2011, and our mission is to improve clinical and public health outcomes by enhancing professional uh, laboratory practice, uh, science, and networks. We operate uh, under five pillars. The first pillar is laboratory networks, where we work with the labs to to network properly to ensure uh, that diagnostic is optimal. The second is a laboratory workforce, so training for lab staff uh, in uh, different aspects uh, so that they are competent. The third uh, pillar is quality of laboratory services, and this is what ASLM is known as being the WHO Afro uh, Secretariat for the SLIPTA program that uh, helps uh, laboratories move in a stepwise manner towards accreditation. The fourth pillar is on regulatory and uh, systems. And the last one is on communication and knowledge uh, management. So the LabCorp uh, is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it was started in uh, 20, 2017. And its aim was to facilitate the improvement of laboratory system function by accelerating the scale up of HIV viral load testing for improved patient management. So viral load is the optimal test that is needed uh, to monitor patients, HIV infected patients on treatment. And you use PCR to diagnose this. And the LabCorp uh, operates uh, through uh, a community of practice uh, the community of practice is composed of members of the Ministry of Health of uh, national governments, implementing partners, uh, clinicians, uh, people living with HIV, and also funders. Uh, currently, the LabCorp consists of 16 African countries, and usually for a country to join, the Ministry of Health has to send a letter of commitment uh, to participate. And what we do, we know that for testing is, is, is not just about the laboratory, but samples have to come from somebody. So that's the community. Uh, so we call that demand creation. We have to create demand for the tests. Then a sample has to be taken, it has to be transported, it has to be tested in the lab. In the lab, we observe quality, a result is released, and that result needs to reach the patient. So we use a self-assessment tool that looks at this cascade uh, of the lab system, and we use that to identify uh, the gaps that uh, exist in the countries. We also know that some countries are doing better than others. And so in, instead of reinventing the wheel, those countries that are doing well can also come in to help uh, those countries that are, are lagging to be able to implement the same uh, systems within their settings to improve uh, the cascade. Once the challenges are identified, then we convene that community of practice where they are funders and we help countries to make work plans, which can then be funded and implemented. And we use a number of strategies. Uh, one of the strategies we use is, to, is the ECHO platform where we connect and invite subject matter experts and also countries to share those best practices, uh, usually on monthly sessions. And we also have a WhatsApp group uh, where the community uh, can interact. If somebody has a question, they can post it there and the subject matter can respond to it. 
We also support countries uh, to go and learn a best practice, so country visits, and also we can send a subject matter expert to a country to help with a particular aspect uh, uh, within the cascade. Every year we have a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, last year we had a mix of face-to-face -face and virtual because of the COVID-19, but in that meeting we assess the progress that the countries have made and we also help to identify the new uh, work plans that can then be funded. So we link them with the funders at these meetings. Then uh, the ASLM also has a website where we post the tools and resources uh, that are generated through the project. We also archive the echo sessions so that uh, people can access those sessions. And we also have uh, lab cookbooks. So these are simple recipes uh, that target each of those weaknesses and how countries can quickly uh, employ some activities to close those gaps. Some of the key achievements, which I'll not mention all, as, is that a number of uh, these plans that we have made have been linked to uh, COP funding and also Global Fund. We also developed a strategic decision metric tool that countries can use once they identify the gaps uh, within their cascade. Uh, we have also uh, established a waste management community of practice. This came about because uh, some of the the products from the molecular testing are harmful to the environment and they are inappropriately uh, disposed of. So we felt that this was important uh, to bring into question. We also provide input in the PEPFA uh, uh, country operational plan priority areas every year. Uh, phase two of the project uh, also builds on the same uh, Thing, the strategies we have worked, and we are still collaborating with those number of partners, the WHO, Africa CDC, CDC International Lab Branch, UNITAID, CHAI, among others. And we continue with the echo sessions. Uh, we will still support country visits, uh, communication and dissemination. We'll still use standardized tools to assess progress. We'll still also have our face-to-face -face meetings where we share progress and the new uh, work plans. And we'd like to ensure that the best practices that are uh, identified are actually implemented. Uh, we also realized that uh, there are challenges in terms of uh, funding. Uh, most funding goes towards uh, Anglophone countries. And so we have deliberately created a Francophone uh, lab corp to cater for uh, the Francophone countries. Again, we, we have also noticed from the self-assessment that some countries are very advanced. And so we'd like those countries uh, to be expert countries who can then uh, help those intermediate countries to uh, demonstrate some uh, impact in terms of interventions that are identified. While for those emerging countries, we will still raise the profile of the lab uh, through advocacy to the uh, leadership within those countries. And with the advent of COVID-19, yeah, the, the, the lab corp is expanding its scope. As you have mentioned before uh, in this uh, meeting, the COVID-19 faces the same chal challenges, like the first presenter mentioned uh, the long turnaround time. So as you, as you know, all diagnostic texts go through that cascade. So, there has been discussion on how to integrate TB and HIV, and that has taken a long time. But COVID gives us an opportunity to again re-engage in terms of integration. So we are taking this as part of a working group uh, to ensure that uh, integration happens. We are also trying to optimize uh, networks because with the COVID-19, we realized that countries were having challenges in terms of uh, expanding testing for COVID-19. Another challenge was uh, um, monitoring and evaluation. So they were not able to account for like the number of tests that are done. They were not able to give accurate figures how HIV was affected uh, by the COVID-19. And so we want to work through these working groups to ensure that uh, the lab corp addresses all issues across uh, the diagnostic network, regardless of the disease area. For the COVID-19, uh, we were able to mobilize the lab corp uh, to offer 
the platform uh, for various trainings. Uh, so Africa CDC, as mentioned before, uh, increased the capacity of testing within Africa from the two that were uh, available in uh, Senegal and South Africa. They trained a number of people uh, in two trainings. And uh, after that training, there was, they reached out to us to help in terms of addressing concerns that trainees were having. So we quickly convened uh, COVID-19 eco sessions where we invited the trainers and also manufacturers to respond to the users' concerns. Uh, we also used the platform to share operational guide guidance from Africa CDC and other partners uh, for COVID-19. Uh, we also had uh, best practices shared by countries like South Korea and the US on how they have dealt with the COVID-19. And we had a number of manufacturing sessions where we invited manufacturers of PCR equipment to come and share what they had and also address concerns uh, by participants. To increase the reach, we uh, started co-translating these webinar sessions and also the documents that were generated uh, from the lab copy. Uh, some of the guidance documents are shown here. Uh, we were able to quickly also address the issues of COVID-19 molecular laboratory testing quality. There were uh, guidance on rapid antibody testing and what, what uh, scenarios to use. And one of the panelists, uh, Professor Peeling, uh, presented uh, on the platform as well. We were able to develop the cookbooks on quality assurance and also uh, decentralizing testing uh, to lo lower facilities. And uh, in collaboration with FIND and the Africa CDC, we were able to develop uh, an in-house test development uh, for molecular detection of SARS-CoV-2. That's for open platforms. Uh, we have also contributed by uh, using our various platforms. We have the Lab Culture Magazine, where we have included uh, diagnostics of COVID-19, uh, quality assurance in one of the issues. And also we have talked about uh, the variants of COVID-19 uh, in the latest issue. Uh, we've also uh, published a number of papers based on what we have learned uh, from the countries. Uh, one of the ones we saw was countries had challenges in terms of maintaining HIV and TB testing during this period. So we conducted that survey and we also learned that uh, countries were really not sure because the, an example is where countries were saying uh, testing has reduced, but then they say they have enough capacity of equipment. And then uh, as an intervention, they still buy an equipment. So some of this equipment can be used inter interchangeably. So like the HIV platforms, uh, testing platforms were also used uh, for COVID-19. Uh, through this project, we collaborate uh, with different partners. One of the ones we are, do, we are collaborating is the International Treatment Preparedness Coalition in terms of increasing demand within countries. Uh, as we know that uh, uh, HIV testing reduced during the COVID-19, so how can we uh, revamp testing by using the communities to pass the message across? Uh, in terms of uh, strengthening monitoring and evaluation systems for diagnostics, we have established a subcommittee of practice for the M and E. So they also have eco sessions every two weeks a month, and uh, this uh, we have invited ICAP, CDC, and WHO as part of the faculty that provide some of these uh, sessions. And our key output uh, for this. Uh, Subcommunity will be able to uh, ensure that we use dashboards more often than not to inform decision making at the national level and also to revise uh, the viral load uh, uh, guidance uh, document framework for M and E to include aspects of other diseases, including the COVID 19. In terms of strengthening uh, the management of laboratories within Africa, we have developed uh, a lab net lead course. Uh, this is complementary to the global laboratory leadership program approach. And uh, through this, we have collaborated with FIND, Foundation Mirror, uh, the 
American Public Health Laboratories, uh, PEPFO and WHO. And we are set to start in quarter three of 2021. Uh, so most of these trainings uh, will be posted in our ASLM Academy, uh, where you can access them if you go to our website. So in terms of way forward, uh, we, as mentioned, we want to update uh, the lab co to ensure that we, believe, we, we deal in uh, different diseases, so integrated testing rather than viral load only, and also see how we can help those countries uh, that have, are very successful in terms of scoring highly in the self-assessment tools. How better can we help them? So we are thinking of using uh, the higher tools like the LabNet scorecard that look uh, beyond just the viral load. And uh, lastly, we want to consolidate these achievements and objectives and also promote pro partnerships uh, with other organizations. And I think ALAT is one of those partners that we can partner with going into the future. Otherwise, thank you. And for more information, you can go to the ASLM website indicated there. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Tieno, for uh, your presentation. Um, it is really exciting to learn uh, some of the work that the a ASLM is doing. Um, I think what ASLM is really know, very well known for is also the you know trying to push for the slip tub, uh, which I think is really critical, uh, especially knowing how critical it is for RT-PCR to be done in the right way. Otherwise, um, you know, contamination is so easy. And especially today when we are trying to fight for recognition of our laboratory results across the world, um, uh, especially these safe traveler systems and all that, really important that we, we do have the, the right systems um, in place coordinated across the continent to ensure that, um, uh, you know, our laboratory capacity really is brought to bear, not, not only in research, but also um, for, for everyday life, especially when it comes to travel and movement across uh, the continent and the world for that matter. I'd like to uh, move to uh, my, my final speaker for this section. I want to, want to introduce Professor Peeling, Rosanna Peeling. Um, as I mentioned, she is currently the professor and chair of diagnostics research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, also the director of the International um, Diagnostics Center. Um, Professor Peeling originally trained as a microbiologist, uh, medical microbiologist, and she has also been the research coordinator and head of diagnostics research at the UNICEF UNDP World Bank WHO Special Program on Research and Training in Tropical Disease, popularly known as WHO TDR in Geneva, and also. Uh, the chief of the Canadian National Laboratory for STDs before she moved on to her current position uh, now at the London School and also the director of the International Diagnostics Centre. She's going to speak to us on sustainable biobanking networks in Africa. Uh, very critical um, that this, this plays into our discussion um, on RT-PCR because um, we really need to be able to look at things in retrospect, and especially if you're looking at uh, case cohort type of designs where you really want to go back into historical samples and use that power of that design to, to determine what really could uh, also answer questions uh, in retrospect and also of course prospectively, um, but you need that biobanking capacity uh, to, to, to make use of, of, of that. So, uh, Professor Peeling, over to you as you take us through uh, sustainable biobanking networks in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to. Um, um, can you can you actually see my slides on the screen? Yes, we, yes, can, we see can see them here clearly, loudly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for asking me to share with you our um, journey for of. Um, actually talking about uh, having a biobanking network in Africa. At the start of the, um, the first training workshop, um, sorry, uh, first training workshop that, uh, uh, that we did in Senegal in February of uh, 2020, 
And um, what, what we did was we started to think about how we could uh, actually think what are the needs for a biobanking network? And as you know, outbreaks of infectious diseases are occurring uh, with increasing frequency and unpredictability. And that we, we needed rapid uh, development and deployment of diagnostics that could have um, uh, give everybody the ability to quickly identify what's happening on the ground as part of uh, epidemic preparedness. And um, uh, throughout the last two decades, we've seen a lot of rapid advances in diagnostic technology, but access to well-characterized specimens remain a, a real significant barrier to both uh, test development and evaluation in Africa. And so we started to think about uh, uh, in 2019, in September of 2019, Africa CDC started a collaborative initiative to advance diagnostics. And during that time, we proposed that we should set up a network of biobanks that could help facilitate the uh, and accelerate the development evaluation and the research on diagnostics that are needed for diseases of public health importance in the region. And so, so then with, uh, with COVID, we started to seriously discuss what are the objectives of such a bank. And, uh, and primarily we want to support diagnostic development, evaluation and research, but we want to be able to provide access to biological specimens and data uh, for diagnostic test development. And, uh, uh, and also for validation of any tests that would be used in the, on the continent. And as the chair mentioned, also for different types of research. And as we've seen right now, uh, research on the variants of concern and being able to sequence them, uh, but have uh, access to specimens that you could sequence to know uh, how variants of concern are spreading across Africa is really important. And, and then we want to not only look at um, single diseases, but also different diseases that may have uh, epidemic potential across the country and be able to set up uh, uh, surveillance networks for them. And for that, we need diagnostics that are really um, uh, be able to give us um, the early alert uh, from the field rather than uh, until people die and, and then uh, specimens are sent for, for uh, investigation. And then finally, to facilitate genomic surveillance and epidemiological research. And throughout the time that I was in WHO in the uh, TDR special program for research and training in tropical diseases, we started to think about these diseases uh, for which um, the companies would not have very much return on investment uh, because, especially for diseases of uh, epidemic potential, because they are needed in high volumes during an outbreak, but during peacetime, there will be hardly any uh, market. And so those are diseases especially for smaller outbreaks um, uh, in the continent, on the continent, such as for cholera, for uh, plague, uh, meningitis, those don't attract um, big companies to come. So, so we wanted to be able to form about banking networks for those diseases, as well as um, the big epidemic diseases like COVID. So over the time that I was in TDR, we formed uh, biobanking networks for schisto, for um, uh, leishmaniasis, for TB and uh, malaria and uh, sexually transmitted infections. And we come up with a, a set of guiding principles, equitable, equitable access to ensure that there's equal access to specimens and pathogen strains to both public and private sector test developers, transparency of all processes, and the specimen should be collected uh, with ethics and informed consent. And we need to respect national laws for uh, whether sports, uh, specimens can be exported out of the country. 
And we know some countries that do not allow that. And then we really think about ownership of these samples. If people are willing to give samples, who owns them, uh, uh, even though they're uh, uh, given uh, to, to a central bank uh, for such use. And also the data, uh, we also want to make sure that the countries retain ownership or the institutions retain ownership of any samples they collected and the data with it, but agree to share. Uh, with the bigger group uh, within the network. And then for the people who contributed to, um, to the network, there should be fairness in compliance with the Nagoya protocol for equitable sharing of benefits that arise from sharing of biological resources. The Nagoya protocol was established in 2010 mainly for biological diversity, so plants, specimens, et cetera. But we've extended it to, um, to having a biological samples for technological uh, issues rather than just botanical uh, specimens. And so there are a number at the bottom of the slide, a number of declarations uh, to guard the, um, these guiding principles and make sure that we comply with them. Now, throughout the time that I, I was in TDR, we set up different banks and based on um, the uh, wishes of the donors and the, uh, uh, the advisory committee for each of the bio banks, uh, we had set up different um, types of bio banks. And uh, with each one, there are advantages and disadvantages. And so, first of all, a centralized model. For the TB specimen bank, that we set up in TDR. Uh, we were funded by the Gates Foundation and they would like us to set up a biobank in a commercial facility and, uh, and have specimens sent from all over the world to that commercial facility and have it be professionally managed. Now, as you could imagine, um, that's nice to have a single infrastructure uh, and then it's easier to manage because everything is at the same place when you have requests for uh, specimens and distribution, assembly of uh, evaluation panels, that makes it easy. But the major disadvantage of that is it's very expensive to engage professional biobanks, which they normally do um, uh, tissue banks for pathology, for cancer, uh, et cetera. And so uh, it's very expensive. There are lots of shipping costs. And with shipment, you risk uh, losing shipment. And we did lose some uh, during uh, ship, uh, the shipping. We also risk the loss of specimen quality during shipping. And then the, the, the material transfer agreements uh, tend to be very complex between uh, a government institution or uh, a research lab with a commercial uh, entity uh, that we engage to do this banking. And then it requires long-term sustained funding because you, you cannot just have funding for three years. What do you do with all the specimens if the fund, you lose the funding? So it's not a very sustainable uh, model. So then for um, other diseases like malaria and dengue, we started to uh, experiment with a regional model because um, mainly because the epidemiology um, of these diseases are uh, different in different regions of the world. Uh, so for, for these we have, um, for dengue, we have a, a, a hub in Latin America uh, based on the CDC dengue branch in San Juan, uh, San Juan Puerto Rico. And then in Asia, we had a hub based on Mahidol University in, in Thailand. And, um, and so that reduced somewhat the, the shipment that's uh, um, required, but you still have uh, sites from uh, the region sending their specimens to the regional hubs and you still need all the material transfer agreements. Now for other diseases for which we have virtually you know, very little funding, uh, such as for all the other tropical uh, diseases, as well as, as for many of the STIs, uh, we actually use a decentralized network model, which we found to be most sustainable 
because you only engage the banks when you need to uh, evaluate some tests or when you need have a uh, request for shipping. And so it's the least expensive uh, because there's hardly any shipping involved except for quality uh, uh, control specimens. And, um, and then what we found was that uh, once we train these uh, sites to do evaluations uh, as well, then we build a country capacity for evaluation as well as for ongoing quality assurance. There are disadvantages because you have sample heterogeneity from site to site, and you really need a very good mechanism for coordination, make sure the quality management of each site. And uh, what we did then was if uh, for any evaluation, we have the companies ship tests to the sites uh, uh, for evaluation. And then we aggregate the results from the different sites into, into one um, uh, complete evaluation uh, for that particular test. So the last one that we did was actually funded um, by, the, by the European Commission. Uh, as part of uh, uh, during the seeker outbreaks, and it's called Seeker Plan for uh, building uh, capacity in Latin America. And for that, we actually had a series of sites uh, around the world, not only in Europe, but also in Asia, um, and also in, uh, with the site in Senegal, um, that's a participation from an African site. And then we have Brazil and the um, Colombia in, in Latin America. And that Bao Bank was uh, very, worked very well. And even today we're supported by USAID and UNICEF to continue to evaluate new seeker diagnostics that have been developed uh, uh, in preparedness for the next seeker outbreak. Now, what about the governance of these uh, uh, biobanks? We learned uh, the hard way from doing many of these biobanks that you really need a very strong internal and external mechanism um, based on the values of protecting the dignity, autonomy, privacy, confidentiality of individuals that are um, contributing uh, specimens to the bank and then uh, to ensure the sh uh, fair sharing of benefits such as um, uh, countries that donated specimens for uh, evaluations or development of tests, having um, uh, negotiated pricing for the final products that have been approved uh, for use. And so you need a legal framework as well as um, a steering committee uh, for the general management of the network, and you need a scientific committee to judge um, the acquisition requests uh, that you get also uh, in terms of any um, of the evaluations that you do. Now for, for the Africa CDC biobanking network, we agreed on some critical attributes that we um, use from the guiding principles that we've identified. And so uh, for diseases of epidemic potential, it's very important uh, that we set up these inventory of expert labs uh, where specimens and pathogen uh, strains are housed they should be rapidly assembled and make um, the specimens available in the event of an outbreak. Um, as we say, you know, we need to comply with um, uh, the governance issues uh, of, that I showed just um, uh, earlier and also comply with ethics in terms of uh, collection of specimens. And we need to use standardized protocols across all the sites and harmonized data collection forms. Um, there should be, each one of the labs should have quality uh, uh, management in place to make sure that not only are the uh, specimens collected in the right way and maintained um, with the uh, integrity uh, in mind, but also make sure that the characterization of those samples are of the highest quality. And, um, and then the sustainability is really important to make sure that um, all the labs um, in the network are um, sustained in, uh, in terms of quality, but they should also 
be sustained uh, from with resources from their own country. Now for the biobanking sites, uh, we have a set of criteria that we set out to make sure that um, labs that comply with these and have the right specimens for the disease network that we want to have, uh, um, they could uh, apply. Uh, and, and also uh, they must show that they are proficient at performing reference standard testing uh, for these to characterize these specimens. Uh, with a robust data management system and uh, a mechanism for, for ethics approval and infrastructure for maintaining uh, power, et cetera. So with, within the Africa CDC Biobanking Steering Group, uh, we have a scientific committee set up and uh, they, they can advise us on specimen collection issues, uh, requests for specimens for test development or use of specimens for lab evaluations. So all those procedures of how the um, uh, procedures are governed by the scientific committee is set out. And then for research, um, initially uh, right now, we would actually engaged in uh, the Institute for uh, Pathogen Genomics within Africa to think about having uh, samples collected for, um, for tracking the variants of concern, et cetera. And so um, there, we're just starting and uh, we have still many sort of the uh, legal framework to work through, but at least the, uh, the manual is there. And we want to make sure that uh, each lab, when they uh, um, have uh, specimens they contributed to test development or specimens that they contributed to evaluation, they could recover those costs from the, either the company or the institutes that request such uh, specimens. Uh, and so, and the biobanking sites directly charge either the companies or in research institutes requesting samples on a cost recovery basis, including a reasonable cost of replenishing the samples that are used. And so um, the benefits of participation, as I mentioned before, would be that um, uh, those institutes or countries will be eligible for subsidized pricing for the products that they help to evaluate or help to develop. So in summary, um, I'm giving you the, um, the link to the manual there uh, for which was published in, in uh, last August and uh, that, that setting up a sustainable biobank network in um, Africa with specimens that are well characterized and strains that are characterized are really needed to facilitate uh, diagnostic development, evaluation and research uh, for diseases of public health importance in, in Africa. And that they, these networks should always comply with the set of guiding principles that we set out and the quality and management um, uh, is very important to make sure that um, these specimens are truly uh, what they uh, represent. And then, you know, as we think about the spreading of the variants of concern across Africa, you could see that having uh, access to uh, well-characterized samples or just having access to uh, banks in different countries that could uh, properly store samples for any ongoing research is, is very important. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you and uh, um, we start the panel discussion to uh, answer questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rosanna, for, for, for that presentation. Um, it, it is really important to recognize how um, biobanking capacity builds into diagnostic um, capacity uh, and, and uh, really appreciating um, th this, this uh, information you provided um, on what it would take to build a sustainable biobanking capacity across the continent. I think it's important we pursue uh, capacity building holistically. Otherwise, you know, if we if we build up RT-PCR capacity, no biobanking capacity, no sequencing capacity, we really don't get the full benefit 
of, of capacity building. So with that, I want to invite all the panelists, uh, Omu, Palmer, Collins, Rosanna, uh, to have your cameras on, if you would, um, while we um, get into our discussion. Uh, there are a bunch of questions that um, I'm sure you see in the, in the Q&A section. And uh, I'd like to uh, start, of, you know, first of all, by um, there's one question from Joseph Kaseda, Kaseka asking if we plan to include more African countries in, the, in a let and asking if we could consider Tanzania. Well, Tanzania is invariably a part of a let in, in, in many ways. Uh, in actual fact, we had um, desired to, or there was an interest to do CCP in Tanzania, but as you are uh, well aware, there have been some challenges um, with collaborative research in Tanzania which I believe uh, uh, gradually uh, be, being addressed. Um, and so we were unable to uh, do the CCP, the clinical characterization protocol in Tanzania. Um, but we do have uh, collaborations with, with several researchers in Tanzania across the NIMRI uh, network. And uh, we're really looking forward to engaging some more um, in the very near future. Um, we are hopeful that uh, lead activities will be able to expand um, across uh, to many more countries. But as I mentioned, invariably, we do have uh, connections with almost every country across the continent because institutions and researchers are all really networked um, through, through different channels. So thank you so much for that. Um, but I'd like to um, ask again, uh, there's a, one question here, uh, which I think is, is very important, which is about ordering of reagents, um, for RT-PCR and how in Africa we can mitigate uh, these issues to allow for rapid diagnosis um, as part of a, a response. And we did see this across the continent, just getting um, the, the regions. I, I recall in the early days of the pandemic um, that uh, uh, Dr. Chikwe, who is the head of Nigeria CDC, actually uh, sent out a passionate plea via Twitter just asking for support with being able to, to, to buy reagents to, to do PCR um, across their centers in Nigeria to support um, the, the, the fight against COVID. Of course, things are much better now, but we can't tell what the next emerging phase disease would be. Um, Umu, I'd like to ask if you can maybe share your experience um, with um, uh, access to reagents for PCR. I know we've had challenges sometimes with even the quality of some of these reagents as compared to some of which we source from other places compared to others. Just a quick comment on that, please. Uh, yes, um, uh, it's, it's quite a challenge. And as I mentioned during my presentation that uh, most of the time we rely on our collaborators from um, uh, outside Africa to um, provide uh, those uh, regions. But even with that, because uh, those regions for PCR and are very sensitive to light or to um, also heat. So it needs a caution to, to be bring, brought to, um, uh, to Africa and go through uh, customs and things like that. So it's very challenging, but um, there's increasingly uh, some capacity that is um, um, uh, building in, in Africa. With, for example, if I can uh, say your name, in Kaba, for example, who are able to uh, provide some of the items. Uh, sometimes uh, the quality is um, can be um, a question and. Uh, at least I know in the past, maybe now it's, it's better. I, I can't tell, but sometimes we had some few challenge, challenges and I'm sure that they are improving with um, more experience. So um, aside in Kaba, I know that there's other uh, companies that are, are growing and mostly they come from South Africa. Um, this is what I can say. So, uh, but it's still, we have still like a lot of challenges. Um, when I was sitting in Germany, I can order today and receive my region uh, the next day. But here I have to think for three months or four months before. And that was uh, even when it was not the COVID time. Yeah. No, thanks, Umar. I do recall when um, 
um, actually to support me in securing some regions for meningitis work, took over six months. Uh, and then uh, we actually had to do a reorder because we just couldn't secure those regions. So these are a real challenge. Uh, Collins, I don't know if you could also speak to this from the ASLM perspective. I don't know if there's any activity around um, trying to support uh, access to regions, maybe moving even into region production in Africa. I don't know if you could comment on this, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I think through the work of uh, Africa CDC, they tried to uh, maintain a corridor for supplies so that even if restrictions were there, flights could still come in to bring goods. The other thing was to combine uh, the needs of the African continent so that they do pool procurement because as individual countries, they need uh, less uh, material and the manufacturers would likely sell to those who want larger quantities. So it was important that there's pool procurement uh, within the Africa region so that they buy as a big entity as well. So those are some of the efforts that uh, were, were made. The other discussions is to uh, develop uh, testing material or reagents locally. And uh, there have been such discussions ongoing. Uh, hopefully in the near future, uh, some of the African countries can produce some of the materials that we might need in a response to a, a pandemic that emerges in the near future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, for that, Collins. Um, I, I, I want to move away from this, but but Rosanna, perhaps you could also speak. I, I should have definitely come to you <laughs> given your, your work. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah, I, just, I just remembered, um, you know, at, at university, um, different companies actually place uh, fridges uh, or freezers um, in, in the university with reagents that many, many labs in the university actually need, like PCR, you know, polymerases, et cetera. And so when you need something, you, you then just go to there and you sign for it and then they, you build for it. And so I could imagine that uh, some of the biobanking hubs could have uh, such inventory ready so that so that so they serve, they serve the, the, you know, the areas um, institutes that were around them and there'll be a much faster transport, right? right. Uh, at, at least at for least the most the commonly used reagents, yeah. Now, Rosanna, I think that that's actually a brilliant, um, you know, uh, thought that, you know, beyond biobanking capacity, it could also serve as sort of a hub for storage of, um, of 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 primers, uh, yeah. you know, regions. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we could have some arrangement with the manufacturer, so we hold for them and yeah. take inventory. Now, that sounds really brilliant. I hope um, someone's taken a note of, of these ideas, uh, so that so you know, really make use of capacity in a in a, in a, in a, in a, in a cost effective way. And I thank you for that, uh, Palmer. I don't know if you have any comments on this subject. I'll be coming to you really soon with very specific questions on. Uh, this 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 uh, co primer technology, but any any specific comments on this um, aspect of um, regent access or production within Africa? Yeah, so thank you. I think this is where the partnerships with our European, just what you've mentioned with uh, Umu being in Germany and you're able to get reagents. This is where that kind of uh, partnership really comes to play. We've used it a lot. I still do it now once I'm in the US to you know, my team in Cameroon. And honestly, that's where that kind of partnership can really play a great role. But talking about you know, production, uh, co-diagnostics, what I know they've done in India is to actually set up a sister company called Coursera that they had the technology actually transferred to them to be able to manufacture locally. But that took a lot of you know, insight from the Indian government. And right now, I think uh, you know, the experience has been a little shaky and I don't know if they are really willing to replicate that, but the discussion is not completely off the table for Africa. And I think it's about looking for where we can see the right partners and then we can you know, start maybe from what is easily doable, which will be maybe conditioning before you know the real production and so once you can condition and preserve as umu mentioned you know the quality is still good by the time the end user finishes with it then you can say okay 
we can now think about production. So I think that it will be a stepwise process if ever uh, co-diagnostics is going to be uh, uh, deploying this kind of transfer to Africa. Well, thanks for that, Palmer. Um, I, I want to address another question that has been asked regarding um, variations in, in quality of, of um, PCR results. Actually, this question was very COVID specific, but we could expand beyond COVID with different PCR manufacturers. We've already addressed this issue in the light of uh, primers or reagents, and we touched on this where sometimes there are challenges with quality of reagents, which then has implications for, for test results. But uh, beyond just the reagents, um, I would think that every PCR machine is a PCR machine. And so uh, there shouldn't be any variations in, in, in test quality. Of course, it depends on what you're really talking about. But in this context, we're talking of RT-PCR. But you also think of diagnostics which have a PCR background, like the gene expert and the biofire and all these, but produce a qualitative result. Uh, but let's restrict ourselves to RT-PCR. Um, uh, maybe, maybe Uma, I should come back to you. I know we have at least two different machines that we use here at our center. Um, um, and uh, is, is there any difference really in the type of machine for, for results? Maybe ease of use, of course, there may be different things, but is it really important? Uh, definitively, it, it depends, actually. Um, it is important because uh, each machine has its own technology. Uh, and development. So uh, sometimes it's possible for, from one machine to the other to have a slightly different uh, performance in depending on how it is. But uh, usually what the um, uh, commercial kit is doing is they test uh, the, the kit across uh, different machines to have uh, the better specs that can be across different machines. But when it comes to a homemade PCR, uh, this is where you can have a challenge from one machine to the other one. And, um, but now the, the commercial kits are for, for especially for um, uh, epidemics or pandemics can, uh, can be uh, purchased maybe easily and it sh might not be uh, too much of an issue, I would say. Um, but it depends, even very small machines we have uh, used, uh, actually now we have more than two different types uh, with uh, COVID. Yeah, the lab is getting uh, very busy, but then of course, of all of this, they, they are able to to um, to have uh, same result, and we do EQC also on that. Yeah. No, thank you for that, uh, Omo. Um, Rosanna, I don't know from your experience uh, with 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 this. Um, I know you do a lot of diagnostic coordination and setting up, and you get to decide uh, what is should be bought and where it should be put. Is, is there really um, some some difference? Uh, sorry, Rosanna. Yeah, it's like uh, I'm still muted. Yeah, yeah. On, on the whole, I, I think it, it would be really good to have more open systems, uh, even though the, the quality uh, aspect, uh, quality assurance aspect needs to be really uh, strict. But open systems allow for, you know, more uh, flexible uh, range of, uh, of testing, et cetera. And so, so I think a, a lot of companies are competing to have, all, you know, the broadest menu possible, but still um, you are then tied to those particular procedures and that particular machine. So I, I think to increase capacity across the continent, I, I think having both open and closed systems um, would be ideal, but I think that uh, more open systems allow more flexibility uh, on the whole, yeah. No, th thanks, Rosanna. Uh, uh, Palmer, I saw you were itching to, to uh, place a comment there. Please go ahead. You, you're right. I was just itching to mention what, uh, you know, completing the statements that uh, Umu was, uh, you know, saying and once you have these commercial kits it's always good to look at the ram time for the machine that you have because that is what you need to really adjust to fit the uh, uh the uh, the specifications of the master mix the commercial master mix that you bought i think that's something which is very kept uh, important to note and i know that because right now i'm dealing with a case in namibia where they are trying to use uh, the co-diagnostic co-primers for a rush machine and trying to set that up has been a little problematic. So 
uh, it's just something that I thought I should note. The ramp up time is what would now determine, you know, what settings you should use on how, you know, you adjust those uh, uh, times allocated for those uh, various uh, steps. No, thanks, Palmer. Also, I think it brings to the fore the need for the real capacity uh, in RT-PCR, because until you understand the, the science behind it and then also the intricacies of the machine, then being able to smartly apply your knowledge to innovate becomes difficult. So a really holistic- That's a whole, separate, a whole separate workshop. Exactly, <laughs> totally, absolutely. Yep, exactly so. Yeah, but but uh, Collins, I want to come to you again, uh, particularly uh, a question on the importance of participation in ECAS. Um, as one is asking about uh, the subscription being quite costly and being a logistical and time consuming issue uh, and any solutions for participation in ECAS. Um, do, you, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, John. So I, what I understand from the question is that uh, external quality assessment is expensive. And uh, I agree it is expensive, depending on how you look at it. The problem is that we look at the cost rather than the cost uh, effectiveness, right? So you want to know what the role of the lab is. The, lab, the role of the lab is to diagnose, whether to, to confirm whether somebody has a disease or not. So imagine if uh, in the case of uh, a HIV patient, you diagnose the person as positive and yet the person is negative, yeah? So a false positive result. It means that individual will be on treatment for the rest of their life, yeah? Now that's wastage of, of drugs. On the other hand, if it's false negative, the individual will go about knowing that they are negative. And in the case of COVID, that will be more transmission, right? So we need to invest in these systems to ensure that the results we give are accurate to the patient and also to ensure that the results are comparable to those that would have been done in another lab in another country. So to maintain that standard, I think it's important that we invest in quality assurance to ensure that the result that we are looking at the Patient, it should be a patient patient centered approach, regardless of the cost. Thank you. No, thanks, Colin. So my takeaway from that is, you know, if the cost is worth it. Uh, find the money, pay for your ECAS, get on with it. <laughs> anyway, it's on the, on the lighter side, but yes, absolutely, a lot of benefit from being sure. I, I think Rosanna picked on this when she made mention of the, the real issue, which is having maintaining the quality standard. You can have the best of machines and best of setup, but if the quality standards are not maintained, contamination, um, you know, curves which you cannot really interpret accurately enough will come in and then, you know, it's all a big waste. So absolutely important to invest in quality systems uh, and, and, and certifications and so on. I want to dedicate the remaining uh, few minutes of the session uh, to the co-primer technology. And uh, Palma, uh, I'm not coming to you right away. I want to go to Kumu, uh, put her on the spot with this, and maybe I'll come to you, Rosanna, as well. Uh, you heard what Palma said about co-primer. You can see he's into it. He lives it and breathes it, and is suggesting that Africa go for co-primer. Um, as, as people who are really knowledgeable in this field, um, Umu and Rosanna, I want your really candid critique, if any at all, or appraisal. Of, of this co primer technology from where you sit, do you think this is the game changer? Is this going to cut it for us? So Umu and then Rosanna and then Palmer, you take us home. Umu? Uh, so yes, yeah, so from, from what I understand from uh, Palmer presentation is um, it seems it's very robust. I think that the, um, um, the RT-PCR has different technology and uh, the approach that the uh, co-primer is using uh, seems very robust because and very specific and, and bring also sensitivity. Um, so I haven't tested it. So I will say that from, from the presentation and from my, what I know about uh, real-time PCR, it looks, uh, the design looks uh, quite robust and maybe more robust than the TACMAN. So uh, concerning the cost also is very attractive, is uh, five times less expensive than other uh, machines. And uh, if it's very stable in terms of temperature 
and, and so on, then uh, it can be a very good machine. Because one of the issue, especially here, uh, is like uh, the maintenance of those machines. Uh, for example, here we had two, uh, one of the big machine to be repaired and there were no uh, local uh, competency for that. We had to send the machines in South Africa and it was a lot of logistic and we were out of machine for a very long time. So um, it's look very robust. Um, it has to be tested. Um, I One thing that I didn't get and I wanted to ask Palmer actually about that is the cost of the reagent because sometimes the machine can be uh, good but then the cost of the reagent can be more expensive for for others and if it's allowed to this machine allowed to be also be able to do homemade PCR and so on and have this flexibility that uh, uh, Rosanna was talking about uh, those are I maybe the things that I, I maybe didn't get, and if all of this is all together, I think that it can be a, a good machine for, for Africa. And no, thank you very much for that, Umu. And Rosanna as well, same, same question to you. Yes, I, I certainly think that um, uh, co-primer technology has a, a really real place uh, in Africa. And, uh, and I think around much of the, uh, you know, um, resource different resource settings because i think that uh, for diagnostics we always say we try to balance three things right the the three a's of accuracy accessibility and affordability and so so uh co-primer technology you know hits the accuracy issue hits the affordability issues and then we have to decide at which level the healthcare system can this technology fit, right? And so it, it may not fit in all levels, but certainly has a, a big place to, to try to expand uh, the capacity for doing RT-PCR across Africa. I think that it's a very promising technology for that and oh, certainly yeah, has really a place. Awesome. But as I say, you know, quality is always important okay so that you could make sure not only for patient diagnostics but for surveillance if you use this for for surveillance purposes you you want the data to to be accurate right to to inform disease control strategies and so uh, the the you know i i know quality is expensive but the 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 cost of not doing quality is even higher right so so it's really important uh, to make sure that with the co primer technology, you come with a very strict set of control, quality controls. Oh. Well, thank you very much for that, Rosanna, and bringing in the, the quality part of it, which is so, so, so critical. Um, Palma, I want to turn to you uh, and this bunch of questions um, on the co primer technology, uh, which I believe you've, you've seen in the Q&A, we can all see that. So also in response to my question, if you could comment further on things like the reproducibility of results on, uh, and the interchangeability of platforms and uh, all the questions that you can see, if you can you know, just wrap up with that. And please, uh, to all participants, uh, thank you very much for coming on. We are not we are far from done. We have um, an hour more to go together with Prof Penlap. Very exciting presentations on the suitcase lab and then sequencing, as I made mention, that dovetail of um, uh, RT-PCR capacity into sequencing, really critical. So please don't be in a hurry to leave. Uh, do stay with us, Paula. Thank you very much, John. And thank you, Umu. I think you hit the nail on the head. I thought 15 minutes was not much and that this will come. And yes, it has come. From who? No one else but you. The cost of the reagent. Let me put it this way. Co-diagnostics was set up to face continents like us, people with the problems. So if I put it that co-diagnostics is ready to work with you to beat out any competition for a molecular diagnosis of that caliber. I think that would send the message across, right? Because I have talked, you know, and the company is really willing and very flexible. The good thing is that it's not a very giant company. So decision-making is very short time, you know, and Tomorrow, actually, we are going into a meeting with some philanthropists 
to see if there are even centers that can use the machine, but do not have the, actually the price I mentioned 14,000, but it's less for Africa is 12,500 to see if they can even provide that machine. And then all they need to do is get their reagents. But I think there's a cutoff number. Stability in temperatures, I cannot really guarantee you on Umu, it needs to go through a cold chain. It needs to be that way for now, because that's how it is. It has to be maintained on very strict, at least freezing temperatures for the reagents. But once you get them in minus 20, it's just fine to keep them in. I keep mine in minus 20 down in the Navajo Nation. The machines maintenance, you don't really need any maintenance. This is the one machine that doesn't have any moving parts. You don't need any calibration. Never, ever again. Once it's out of the factory, you have it. You don't have anything to do with, you know, doing calibration or whatever. You don't need that. All of that is already taken care of. So the fact that it has no moving parts helps it really uh, to uh, avoid that kind of problems that you are talking about. And uh, the system that I'm told would work is that if ever you get a code DX box and it gets into any fault, all you need to do is send an email and you get a replacement while we look at what the problem uh, of your uh, code DX box can be. And so I think I've tried to address those kind of problems that you've mentioned. Homemade PCR and using the CODEX box, yes, you can do that. Uh, CODEX, uh, co-primers co into any other platform is done. And that's what I was trying to tell you about the case in Namibia where we are trying to use a Rush uh, Light Cycler 480 to be able to uh, you know, do uh, and uh, uh, assess the accuracy of our co-primers. Uh, co so that is done and the interchangeability is really possible. Accuracy, affordability, and accessibility. Accuracy, we've already mentioned, so we'll save time for that. Affordability, I have mentioned uh, price-wise. You don't have anything to really worry about. Name your price, and uh, co-diagnostics will work with you on that. Uh, but right now, at least the test is under $10. So it's uh, actually uh, about $7. So just so you know, for those who uh, are really willing to get it now for COVID-19, for TB, it's down to like, what, $3.5, $5. And then for malaria, it's about that also. Right. So interchangeability of platforms, I've addressed that. Quality controls, uh, the at least for the tests that have been developed so far, they have very robust negative and positive controls. So yes, Rosanna, you're right, but those controls are included in the kit that you, you know, you purchase, so you don't, you do not just get the master mix, but you also get the positive and the negative controls in uh, your kit that you purchase. And the conditioning are different. You know, you have 100, 250, 5,000. And so if you get a 5,000, which would basically be cheaper, then you can, you know, aliquot those and make sure that you just for avoid, to avoid contamination, as Umu was saying, try to really keep your negative and positive controls separate and wherever you're doing your, your samples, you know, that's where maybe you want to do the positive control and don't get your negative control anywhere near that room or that uh, compartment that you've reserved. I think that's what Umu was trying to reserve, uh, uh, refer, refer to when she was making her presentation. And so I think on that, I, uh, um, I think, yeah, I think we're, we're, I, I really don't want to eat into for pen laps time. So maybe what we could do is if there are a few more comments, um, I know there's so many more questions coming rather unfortunately towards the end, but maybe during the, the next Q&A session, perhaps you could then take the opportunity to uh, carry on Palmer, please go on. But you are muted, so we can't hear you. Sorry, I was just saying that just for one question, about the lowest detection limit, you can actually detect, you know, you don't see less than one virus, but it's under one. Very well. Yeah, thank you, Palmer. And I really want to say thank you uh, to you, um, uh, Professor Peeling, uh, Dr. Uh, Otieno, uh, you, Dr. Netongo Palmer, Professor, and uh, Dr. Umu, 
Thank you so much uh, for this really exciting uh, presentations and discussions. I think it's been insightful for all of us. There's more coming up uh, with Professor Penla, uh, who will take uh, us through another set of presentations with uh, uh, the, the next set of panelists. So please stay with us. Uh, the, the short break is almost completely consumed. So Welcome back to the second session of the ALERT RT-PCR training. We will now go to the next presentation. We are having two. The first one will be presented by Francisco Veas from the French Research Institute for Development. He is part of the ITAL COVID-19 network. We are presenting on implementing the EPO technology a new RT-PCR approach for the detection of infectious agent. And the second one will be presented by Name Kadodo of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Chief Bow Engineer at the NCD. See, it will be presenting of the strategies to overcome the challenges to deploy or expand lab network of co-primary based artificial diagnosis in Africa. Then following these two presentations, we will have a poll and panel discussion that will be chaired by Palma Notongo. Thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to be part of this workshop again. And I hope you will enjoy this session. So on, it will be mainly focused on deployment of suite case lab for rapid detection of SARS-CoV-2 in low resource settings. So I'm uh, Moussa Moesian from Institute Pasteur de Dakar, and, and I'm actually the work actually two lab co uh, coordinator. And so it's uh, always a pleasure to be part of a consortium uh, workshop. Okay, so um, you can say that it's actually the era of uh, emerging infectious diseases. And most of the latest outbreaks uh, uh, occur in remote and poor settings area. You have, for instance, the, the case of a plague in Madagascar in 2017. You have measles, who caused uh, around 6,000 of deaths in GRC in 2020. And more recently, we have an Ebola outbreak in Guinea uh, uh, after five years of, of silence. So, um, when we talk about remote area, we think about um, laboratory mobility issues, of course. And indeed, how to manage the lab staff can be a nightmare. Uh, you can see me here uh, waiting for reinforcement for help to move equipment from uh, the landing zone. It was in the Equator province in DRC in 2018. So you can see how uh, it can be complicated to, 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 to manage uh, uh, the, um, the lab staff. And also we have a problem of the energy with some areas without electricity or even with uh, unsta unstable uh, voltage. And so it can be really tricky to, to work with. Um, it was previously said by Rosanna Peeling that uh, a good diagnostic tools need some specific characteristics. Yeah, so it, it should be highly sensitive, provide rapid res, uh, results. It should be inexpensive, easy to use, of course. And also it should be stable at temperature greater than 30 degrees Celsius for field use. And during years, uh, our teams in IPG work for the improvement of diagnostic solutions. Um, previously, uh, on the field, stable QPCR targeting uh, several viral emerging fever viruses was, de was developed. You can see here um, uh, some lyophilized solutions uh, for QPCR that was um, elaborated with, in collaboration with uh, a team in, in Germany. And after that, we were able to to evaluate the, the results uh, obtained in Dakar, the capital, but also in a remote area called Kedugu in the southeastern part of the country. And we can easily see, uh, observe that we have a, a comparable um, reproducible uh, results here, uh, meaning that uh, the, the different um, solutions uh, were very stable. And if this platform gave quite a good result during some outbreak, such as the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, 
the problem of power stability as well as the need for equipment like thermocyclers and the need for faster ACs remains. This is why um, we try to address these issues by testing several technologies, over technologies or approaches. In 2015, for instance, we used a glove box to, for sample inactivation and RNA extraction. Um, and all the equipment for molecular assays were contained in a single suitcase, so-called the lab suitcase. Uh, and this, uh, all the stuff worked very well with uh, solar energy, as you can see here. And we're able to get um, a di Ebola rapid diagnosis in 15 minutes using what we call the, RP what is called the RPA for recombinase polymerase amplification. So this RPA, as we say, um, and use the dried primers in pellets. Uh, so meaning that it is quite stable uh, in terms of temperature and uh, like is very um, uh, adapted, adapted for, Africa, uh, for, for Africa context. And the system proved its work during the 2015 epidemic in Guinea. And since 2013, Nearly 300 publications on RPA were produced, highlighting the growing uh, interest for this uh, technology. So what is the uh, RPA for recombinase polymerase amplification? We have several advantages. So it's of course isothermal. It can work between 2025 and 42 degrees Celsius. It's fast. We can have results uh, in up to 20 minutes. It's quite sensitive. Uh, we can sometimes can catch less than 10 genome copy uh, in a single uh, essay. It's affordable, 4.3 US dollar per test. It, it's really simple to use um, uh, in, we can just uh, learn how to, to work with in about 15 minutes. And the only disadvantages will be the limited uh, multiplexing capabilities. So just to go quickly for the, um, for the the principle of, uh, of this uh, technology, the RP reaction, exploit an enzyme known as uh, recombinase here in green, which form uh, complexes with oligonucleotide primers here uh, and pair the primers with the homologous sequences in duplex DNA. A, a single DNA binding uh, protein, the SSB, uh, bind to the displaced DNA strand and stabilize the resulting D loop as you can see in this, in this picture. DNA amplification by polymerase is an initiated from the primer like a regular PCR, but only if the target sequence is, is present. And once it's initiated, the amplification reaction progress rapidly so that starting with just a few target copies of DNA, the highly specific DNA amplification reach detectable levels within minutes. So it's, that's why it's really, really fast. And you can make it uh, like a qualitative, uh, like a real-time RPA by adding a probe here, which is clived by a exonucleus free uh, enzyme. And we have also like a three or four in the equation, which is a, we can, which is a proportional in terms of, uh, uh, for instance, emission with a number of, uh, of copy um, uh, after each uh, cycles. So the RPA for SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic, um, just a, to talk about in few words of the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 situation actually. So since um, late 2019, early 2020, we, have this, we are facing actually a SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, a COVID-19 pandemic. And we, on January 13, 2020, the WHO Emergency Committee declared it's a um, global health emergency. Uh, this is some um, uh, some information about the number of cases, the number of deaths. It was on the June 2026. So uh, actually, due uh, view this situation, numbers that the system are in uh, in development, and among them, uh, we have a traditional RT-PCR based on after the sample collection on a regular and extraction that can take. 45 minutes, you have this reverse transcription, which can take one hour per primer set. After that, you have the RT-PCR amplification, which can take uh, 
uh, sometimes more than an hour and you have your positive your free results which is error positive or negative and so you can see that easily see that it can take really a long time to from the sample collection to the result to the, to the, to the results so what we need actually uh, it's a quick solution you have um, a numerous uh, as i said previously numerous uh, solutions request cast based detection the heptamer based detection the traditional rt pcr based detection you have also the antigen antibody based detection but uh, we need a a rapid molecular uh, test to detect asm both asymptomatic and symptomatic um, people uh, meaning that we should be able to have a decentralization for that diagnostic, deliver results in short time, deliver tests to poorer resource settings, and decrease the operation cost. So, and in order to respond to the four Ds uh, uh, showed here, RPA can be a good solution with a de result delivery in less than 15 minutes. So the mobile mobile suitcase lab for SARS-CoV-2. So I will just uh, um, present uh, show some results from a paper already accepted, and so I invited you to to have a look on this paper if it's not the case, actually done. So uh, this is the suitcase lab here. You, you can see that we have a, a small lab here with pipettes, your gloves. You have a, the centrifuge, the vortex, and you have these things called the T8 isothermal instrument, which is just a high, highly flexible bench top and a fit deployable platform uh, that can be used to provide both quantitative and uh, qualitative results for molecular diagnostic isothermal assay. And you have also this the famous glove box uh, for, the, for the safety of a personnel during manipulation. And you have overall for the duration of a test extraction plus uh, RPA 20 minutes, meaning that you put after sample collection, you can um, uh, put your swabs uh, on your lysis buffer, eat it at 95 degrees Celsius for five minutes. And after that, um, after you can just start uh, using the, the RPA process with uh, master mix a, a isothermal amplification in 50 minutes at ever, uh, depending on what you of uh, the type of primers uh, at uh, between 32 to 42 degrees Celsius. So uh, regarding the results obtained during our studies, we we designed first three type of um, of, uh, of, um, of system the rdrp the e of the engine you can see here the, the, the different uh, sequences for each oligon oligonucleotide and what we have here firstly we, we evaluated the sensitivity of each uh, assays with a standard and you can see in red here the, that the rdrp1 had the be a better sensitivity than the, the other one. We have, after that, assess the specificity of uh, different um, assays here with uh, 31 uh, viral strains. And it was obvious that um, uh, all the different assays have a good uh, specificity. After that, we, we make a um, you can see here the result obtained from clinical samples with CT values ranging from 19 to nearly 40 uh, after qPCR. And on the far left ordinate, you have the CT values uh, got through RT-QPCR in the right, the right one. It's uh, the three short times, meaning the time to have a positive result in uh, RPA. And you can observe that whatever the CT value is, the free short time is shorter with the RDRP. So you can see that you have RDRP E and N. So it's, uh, mean, uh, the mean, um, mean time is shorter with the RDRP than with uh, all, all the, the other two um, essays, meaning that it's more sensitive than the, the E and N target. So definitely all the results received allowed us to say that the RDRP essay is the most accurate essay for the detection of a SARS-CoV-2. And I'm talking about RT, uh, RPA, of course. And 
it was about sorry uh, 46 clinical samples and actually the most important thing will be to make this evaluation on more uh, um, bigger uh, number of samples and this is why actually uh, we continue this evaluation of this RGRP uh, targeting RPSA in a multicentric blinding study with some uh, partners through uh, EDCTP uh, funding the project and all over all ones and uh, I hope that we'll be able to share with you very soon uh, uh, some interesting region, um, results. So um, thank you for your attention, and I hope that uh, you have a pleasure, you had a pleasure to to see what can be the potential for the, uh, the RPA. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Moussa Moïse, for this presentation. If I can give a summary of what you have said on the development, the necessity to develop a good diagnosis tool, especially from this um, last impact of outbreak of COVID-19, where really we need to have sensitive, less costly, easy to use, stable equipment and method to diagnose our, our pathogen. That is a, is a very good um, a process that in which you, you, have, you have organized in among your, your, your team. And um, especially before I go to the panel discussion, I would like to ask you, considering this mobile suitcase lab, what about the cost of this suitcase mobile lab and the maintenance of these compared to our environment in Africa where uh, we have this temperature with the climate which is very, sometime very high. How can we transport this from site to site to do what you are, you try to say. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so regarding the cost of uh, RPA, uh, it's cheaper, really cheaper. I said previously that uh, for a reaction, it will be less than four hundred. Uh, now it's less than four hundred uh, for four dollars. Sorry. Uh, so and it will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper again. So um, in regarding the maintenance, there is no maintenance at all to make. So it's somehow close. Especially um, um, concerning the regions, because inside your seat cage, you have regions that yeah. we, use, we have to transport from site, in, especially from poor, at poor settings, where we have to go and do our experiment or to do the diagnosis, meet the patient. How can you okay. ensure the stability of these regions? Yeah, that's why. Okay, so the, the, actually, the, all the reagents are lyophilized. So, okay. the enzyme, the RT enzyme, and all the polymerase, and all the, the, the um, all the enzyme and primers are actually dried. So, meaning that there is no uh, any um, need for additional um, uh, storage. I mean, in terms of a cold chain uh, to worry about. This mm -hmm. is it's really um it's really attractive so and we uh, tried it in very different condition uh, in uh, very hot places and very cold ones and the reagent were almost the same so that's why um it can be really um a very very good solution for africa so it's yes, cheap. that is a very good uh, solution for our setting here. That's why really I would, I would like to know, do we need uh, to train people to how, on how to use this? Okay, so that's a Compared good question. Compared to other artificial methods and so on. Is yes. there any other additional capacity we, should, we need to have to be able to use this? Uh... Not really, it's, a, it's a, almost a, a, a a PCR with some specific uh, point, uh, but not, it's mainly uh, GCLPs, uh, specific GCLPs for RPA, but not in, uh, broadly it's a QPCR. So it will be easy for a molecular, um, molecular technician. Yes. I would say 15 minutes should be, more, less than 15 minutes should be enough for, to, to learn how to, to so do you have, we are going now to, to the panel, if there are any questions for, for the panel, if someone have any question to, to ask to Moise, Diane, 
for the presentation is just just right prop and lab oh, let, me, let me come in here and uh, uh, also thank uh, musa for that presentation and uh, Musa, the last slide that you showed about those samples, you know, we could see that there was a huge variation in some of those, uh, uh, the, the graph that you just showed. And I was wondering, yes, this one, I was wondering if these are the same samples that you used across all of these different tests. Okay, so you track which sample, for instance, this one is, is it the same? sample that is the outlier in say the qpcr that is the outlier in the rdrt uh, rpa assay yeah they are they are, they are yeah, the same one. one so all of everything was just done parallel and so we it's almost complicated maybe to to see in this picture but uh, we try to test every sample with a different um rpas he says, and also with um, QPC one, and it was that's why we were able to see that uh, the mean value was uh, um, more interesting with uh, RTRPA targeting the RT, uh, RP. But yeah, uh, every sample was the uh, different uh, RT uh, PCR and the three uh, RTRPA says. Um, and you see, you. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> a few more questions have come up to the uh, the chat box for you, uh, Musa. And the question uh, that comes is uh, that given that uh, you have this uh, lovely technology, uh, the RPA, whether it's uh, something you will consider, uh, you know, linking that with the co-primer technology, because the, uh, Bonnie was asking this question, Bonnie Webster says that they're worried about you know, the secondary uh, structures of uh, primer dimer formation, for instance. Is that something that you wish to consider? Uh, to be honest, when you, uh, <laughs> you are showing the, you make you are ma making the, um, the presentation and the core primers, I was planning to talk about that with you later. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <yeah. Okay. laughs> exactly yeah. a, a good potential. So maybe, okay. We can see if we can make because the, the, the only disadvantage, as I said previously, one of our my slides was the, the difficulty to make the multiplexing, the multiplexing for, for the RPA. So uh, I think definitely that using the, the core primers uh, approach, uh, we can have a solution for this point. So yeah, why not? Alma, we are not hearing you. Oh yeah, I, I forgot that each time they, uh, I have to be unmuted. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I was saying that because that's another question you're right that has come from Don Williams. He was asking if uh, the RPA could be multiplexed, for instance, for the R, uh, R, D, uh, RP gene and the N gene. Uh, so I think that you've uh, answered that question already. Yeah, yeah, and so the next question that comes is from Derek, and he wants to know how exactly uh, the glove box works in regards to protection of the personnel. All right, thank you. And um, so, yeah, the one advantage with the glove box is easy to 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 move. So it's very light, and all it's uh, different species species of, um, and it's really easy to assemble to and disassemble. Also, this is how you, you enter your, your, this is a gloves here. You can see here, the samples can be uh, entered here. There is two, two SAS, two doors, indoors here and here. And you have also the garbage store here, just, but it's, yeah, it's hard to, to see it in, the, in this picture. And you have a, um, so it's mainly a physical barrier, but you can, uh, it's, it's not like an airflow, but it's mainly physical, actually. And you, you, so you, you, you enter your hands here, your gloves, and the sample enter here. And there's another uh, doors outdoors here. When you, when you're done with your all your manipulation, you can just throw out your, 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 your garbage, all the things. I think that I can share with you all guys the, a link 
uh, uh, for um, a kind of YouTube. I think if you have a YouTube uh, a video uh, when you can see how to, to use this uh, glove box if you want to. Okay, Pamela, there are other questions that have been asked concerning the problem of reagent and shipment ordering that many labs have been facing during this COVID-19. And also, how do you manage the false negative uh, samples with this, uh, with this technology? Do you have any internal control? Yeah, definitely. So uh, what we use actually as a negative control is a human uh, able to, to target human um, human uh, material. And so sometimes you can have a specific of a control, control, of course, allowing us to, 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 to be comfortable with our essays, of course, yeah. And I think there is a last question about how many samples uh, can you run at a time, Musa? Okay, so um, here there is a um, here is a T eight because you can only use eight um, eight reaction at a time, but you have also the T sixteen. Unfortunately, we can go up to T uh, more than uh, sixteen because <laughs> it would be a bit complicated to put it in a suitcase. So the maximum actually is uh, sixteen at a time. 16. Okay, thank you. Prof. Benla? Yes, do you have any, um, um, I don't know, what you can say about the, the, the maintenance of this, uh, of this technology? How can we do in Africa? Uh, that's what, that's, this is why this is really interesting because- Do we have to uh, train someone for that? In no. Order? Because there is no uh, maintenance for this one, except for the pipettes, and I mean for the, the, the normal things. I would say in brackets, um, uh, the T eight is uh, stable, no need. Uh, there is no re um, maintenance required, so it's quite easy. Just a, a regular BP, uh, GCLP, uh, meaning uh, uh, to clean the pipettes and all these things. So. Except that there is no other things to, to do. That's why it's very, uh, really, very, really, very really easy to, to, to manage. Okay, thank you, Moise. Thank you for the presentation. We will now move to the, to the next presentation. That will be done by uh, Namika Dodo of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, Chief in Bioengineer at NCDC will be presenting on strategy to overcome the challenges to deploy explant lab uh, network of co-primary based RT-PCR diagnosis in Africa. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, good, uh, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be from. I'm very honored to be invited to be part of this um, presentation. Co-primary technology is really a very good one. And uh, we are also privileged in our lab to have also validated uh, the, the primary sets, the, the kits. And uh, it was really very superlative in this uh, outcome. So, but I'm actually going to be talking about um, our experience concerning sequencing. Yeah, so I'll be talking about our experience because after detection using PCR, you have to move over to what is happening at the moment, trying to sequence, trying to sequence the, the samples, the positive samples from PCR detection. And so far, we have been privileged to be sequencing SARS-CoV-2 at the National Reference Lab of NCDC, Nigerian Center for Disease Control. And we want to share our experience so far. So as all we know, uh, as we all know, 
we know that the coronavirus is actually a coronaviridae, uh, belongs to the coronaviridae family. And uh, what interests us is that it represents a crown like spikes on the outer, it presents a, a crown like spikes on the outer surface of the virus. That's why we call it coronavirus. And then it's also an enveloped virus, which is also very minute in size. Some people were saying it can be packed, millions of it can be packed under a pin, head of a pin. So, and it, contain, it contains a single stranded RNA, uh, which ranges between 26 to about uh, 32 KB. And we have seen that for this novel coronavirus, is actually we have been looking at something a little below uh, 30,000 KB. So we are 30,000. Uh, so we have usually between 29,000 to 2,900 or so. So concerning the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, it was detected in Nigeria on 27th February, 2020. For us, it was a, a, a day that changed everything we know about. So it's really evoked quite a lot of response. And um, we have been waiting after preparing ourselves for detection of this uh, SARS-CoV-2. Once uh, uh, WHO predicted that Lagos, Nigeria represent one of the high risk areas. So we kept ourselves prepared to detect uh, using the appropriate uh, primers and probe. So immediately, this was detected. We decided to tell a complete story, a Nigerian story, by using all the labs that have the capacity to sequence to do all that we can do to have the first um, SARS-CoV-2 genome thrown out from Africa. So Nigeria was one of the first countries to send the first uh, genome to uh, GC from Africa. So by 16th March, after the first one that was done using the Illumina MySeq by the SGH, African uh, Center for Excel, um, uh, the Dimas University, uh, African uh, uh, Center for Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Disease, SGH. And then we also worked with the NIMA, the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research that have the capacity using the Sanga sequencing to also look at some sequences of that first, first uh, genome. So on the 16th March, we at NRL of NCDC were able to also try to use metagenomics to sequence the index case, which can be shown, can be shown here. And um, so after that, the first detection, we have had over 2 million tests, PCR detection of uh, SARS-CoV-2 done. And out of that, we can see that we have, we have a confirmed case of 167,543, out of which about 163,982 are recovered and the death remains about 2,120 as of today. So in Nigeria, we have four labs that have the sequencing capacity so the first is the Redimas University, SGH. It uses a plethora of uh, Illumina machines, like the MySeq, the HiSeq 4000, the NovaSeq, the uh, recently acquired the NovaSeq 6000, which is a high throughput instrument for sequencing. Then the National Reference Lab started sequencing around the uh, end of uh, December, but actually did the first sequencing using the around that 16th, uh, 16th March, like I mentioned. So we did not do start massive uh, sequencing until towards the end of uh, last year. So at the National Reference Lab of NCDC, we use the Oxford Nanopore, the Minion. We have like three units of Minion, which we are using to um, do our sequencing. And recently we have also start, we acquired a MySeq a uh, next generation sequencer from Illumina, which we have also used now to uh, start depositing sequences to GSET. We have a, a couple of other sequencing platforms, but uh, many of them are angel, uh, Sanger sequencers. We, we have uh, like uh, six studio, about three or four of them 
in our lab now. And we also expect to have a, a ABI 3500 soon. So we have another lab, the University of Ibadan, which are uh, sequencing in collaboration with uh, Northwestern University. And they also use Minion uh, and MySeq. So the Nigeria Institute of Medical Research also sequence with Sangha. They use Sangha sequencers and also have some NGS platform, an NGS platform which they are using. And recently they also started sequencing with Minion. So from the global uh, update in Africa, we can see as at uh, today, we have uh, over 2 million sequences deposited to GSEG, um, out of which 24, just small number, 24,000 coming from uh, Africa. So we need to really come up. We need to have, embrace more of this technology to have more sequences uploaded to GSEG. So, and out of that, Nigeria has about eight, eight, 876 but the bulk of it's coming from South Africa, which I will also share, share later on. So from the African side, I, I call it the SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance in Africa. We can see that the South Africa continues to lead the pack with over 10,396 sequences. And we are really uh, impressed with South Africa, what they are doing, they're trying as much as possible to have a lot of sequences come from uh, that side. We have seen Egypt, we have seen Kenya, and Nigeria is also uh, having this 800, uh, 876, and we are counting. Even as we are talking, we are sequencing, we are trying to uh, put more sequences to g you know, particularly to track the variants, to know how we fare in our country and other parts of the of African continent. So our workflow remains like this. When we receive the sample, and then or we retrieve it from the archive. We do, uh, normally we try to repeat the uh, PCR amplification just to know the CTs and then to be sure that they are actually amplified, uh, there are also positive samples. And then we'll now uh, do RNA extraction. And then we also, uh, after extraction, we now do the retesting and then we'll load, prepare our libraries, put our barcodes and then load on flow cell. After which we assemble a genome and then, then do the normal alignment using the uh, various uh, platforms available, either Nesclade, or we use uh, Pangolin for lineage assignments, <clears throat> and then, or uh, maybe Curve Blue, uh, and then finally upload to GC. So far, the update from Nigeria, our genomic surveillance so far shows that a total of uh, as 876 viral genome have been deposited to GSET. And from there, all the four labs sequencing in Nigeria, the SG remains contributes about six, 611 of these, which is about 70% of the genome so far. About 134 is coming from the NCDC National Reference Lab, which we, we, I lead. And then this uh, lab uh, from UI has 74%, which is 8.4. And then NIMA has 47, which is 5.47% of the genome so far. And then there are these uh, about 10 sequences that were deposited in this set in the name of uh, University of Medjugorje through collaboration with uh, a, 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 a center in Italy. So concerning the, our interest to track the, the essence of our genomic surveillance is just to be able to track the variants, what we have in country. So, so far, the variance of concerns, we have the variance of concerns and variance of interest. And uh, we have been able to detect one variant of uh, concern, which is the V117 or the, the, the alpha variants. And then this known variant of interest, the eta variant, which is the B1525, which is uh, known to start as uh, started from U, uh, UK and Nigeria. We have seen quite a lot of them in Nigeria. And then you can see six of these variants have been designated the variants of interest. We have also seen some, about four of them being the variant of concern. And you can see the alpha, the alpha, the beta, the gamma, uh, which actually was detected first from um, uh, Brazil. And then the delta variant that comes from, uh, is detected in India first, and then the epsilon and uh, the rest of them, and then the one of, that interests us, this eta variant that contains the E484K mutation that uh, is, uh, is 
clear to uh, lead to drive uh, immune escape. So these are the variants we have seen so far, and some of them have some uh, characteristic mutations that we, we know them for. This one, the B1427 stroke B1429, which is known to circulate in California, that carries this L452R mutation. This mutation uh, is known to also drive a uh, lot of transmission. And earlier in Nigeria, like we uh, will see in this talk, we had, we saw quite a lot of them uh, uh, in Nigeria in some, some of the strains, the B110 and B11, we saw quite a lot of them. And then this E484K mutation and this S477 mutation that's also found in this uh, variant that uh, is detected in, in, in the US. Now, for us, the, these variants of uh, concern, the B117, which originated in UK, in Nigeria, we have detected about 141, 141 of these uh, uh, genome, uh, of these very, very particular variants. That's about 16% of the genome in Nigeria have this. So this, 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 this uh, uh, alpha variant carries this uh, M501 mutation, which is known to drive, is high, highly transmissible, over 50%, like in UK. And then we have seen quite a lot of it, about 16% of it in Nigeria. So, so from January to June uh, 2021, we have seen uh, this number. This was first detected in, uh, in December 29th in Nigeria. And um, bulk of it came from SZ, about 89%. This is 14% of the genome coming from there. And then 47%, this is 3%, also came from the UI, Northwest Collaboration. And 5% came from our lab. Actually, these were travel related inbound patients, uh, in, inbound samples from, from travelers. So we, we tested it because Nigeria made it compulsory that anybody, any coming in from outside UK, South Africa and other places will have to uh, undergo this test uh, sequencing. So we, we were able to track like four or five of them at the moment from these inbound uh, um, travelers. So, so far in Nigeria, we have not detected this B135, which is a beta variant from South Africa. We have not seen any of them in Nigeria. And then we have also uh, known this currently very, very topical variant, the data variant uh, that is first detected, was first detected in India. We don't have this also in Nigeria, but we're also going to give you updates of how it's spreading in, in Africa and other parts of the world. So then the most common variant of interest in Nigeria is this B1525. This variant is very, very important because of the presence of this E4A4K mutation. This E4A4K mutation is being seen in this uh, uh, beta variant in South Africa, as well as the gamma variant in Brazil. So they, have, they also are, scared, we, we, they are known to uh, drive the E4A4K mutation is, is, is fear to drive an immune escape. So then, in our lab in, at NCDC, we have about 69 of the genome sequenced and uploaded to GSIB, having this, uh, being of this particular variant, which is about 51% of data we have. So, and these are from samples we collected from January and February, and uh, which we submitted between the February and June 2021. So of the samples from the UI, 17% of them, that's about 23% of these were of the of, of this uh, B1525 variants. So what we are saying is that right now in Nigeria, the highest circulating variant is this B1525. And that, um, that is of also concern. So recently, again, we started seeing another variant under investigation, which is B1, B11318, that is carrying this also E484K mutation and P68H uh, mutation and they are known to mediate immune escape. So they are, these are really of concern. Recently, we have seen an upsurge in this uh, genome. And we, are, we have about 8% of the genomes submitted carrying this, uh, uh, being of this variant. 
and uh, by the breakdown, it's about 20% from SG, 15% from NCDC, and three from, from this. Then there are also some two cases with FA27 variants uh, uh, in, in country from the sample which we sequenced from February to March. Now, across Africa, we have seen that as of today, the B117, which is the alpha variant, we have about 156, uh, uh, 1,560 sequences from Africa of, being of this particular uh, variant of concern. Uh, from DRC, Guinea, to Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, and Djibouti, many African countries have been having this variant. Then this Delta Kappa variant, which is the B1617.1, uh, detected firstly from India, as of today, about 43 of sequences have been detected in Africa and from countries uh, reported, reporting these samples are Uganda, Ghana, South Africa, Angola, Malay, uh, Malawi, and Mauritius. So then concerning the, the Delta variants, the B1617.2, uh, no, uh, 618.2, uh, so this, this is a variant that has been reported in South Africa, DRC, Uganda, and Morocco. You know, and then as of today, we have seen like 550 sequences uploaded to GCN from Africa so far. So you can see the team is spreading. In fact, I was surprised today when I was looking at GCN from South Africa, most of the sequences uploaded today were all from this uh, Delta variant. And these variants are thought to cause increased hosp hospitalization increased transmission and quite a lot of uh, concern. So we are seeing a lot of it. So this calls for more uh, genomic surveillance. We are also looking hard in our country to see this uh, uh, variant, uh, whether we can detect them, but so far we have not detected them. Then this other uh, B161.3 variant has, not been, uh, has also been reported in Malawi. And as of today, about 12 sequences of related to GZ carry this particular variant. So concerning Nigeria, to show the details of our surveillance, as of today, we can see variants. We are looking at monthly detection of variants in Nigeria. We can see from between January, February, and March up to April, we saw quite a lot of uh, alpha variants, the B117 variants dominating. And as of April, we have seen them uh, kind of diminish. And then from also, uh, January to April through May, we have also seen quite an uh, upsurge in um, the ETA variant, the B1525, which is known uh, to uh, have originated from Nigeria and the uh, and UK. So you can see again that we are seeing this B1, 11318 again, arising from between the same uh, time. So these are the two common, uh, three common variants we are seeing across Nigeria. So before, before February, before between uh, December and February, before this time, we have had results. The initial sequencing we are as shown from this uh, table. You know, some of the sequences began with uh, B1, 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 B1110, and you can see some classic mutations and uh, amino acid uh, changes we have seen them. You can see that early, we are still seeing some of them like this L4, uh, L452R as early as uh, before even uh, December, we are seeing such, such mutations in Nigeria. But recently, these are the main mutation that is uh, one of the key mutations driving this uh, Delta variant and also some variants in the US. We already started seeing, we saw them in Nigeria, but uh, uh, we don't know uh, why we are not seeing that spread as we are seeing in 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 the other places. So we these are the classical things we saw before this time, and we can also see a graph of it. But then from February to from February to uh, around February, we now started seeing a different kind of outlook. We are started seeing some of these variants emerge. Uh, that they, they began to emerge in Nigeria, the 1525, one and all that. You can see them with their various mutations they carry. So these are the spike mutations, the different types of spike mutations we have also detected. You can see the E4A mutation, 
You can see this 61G, which was the, that led the first wave. And you can see these, these mutations that are defining most of the, the variants of concern and interest, the E4A4K and then uh, M5O1Y, which we are seeing. And then this L45R2, we have been able to detect them all in Nigeria. So concerning the next clade assignment of pangolin, this was the, we had started with 20A and then 20B. And now we can see all these other uh, types of strains have been detected in Nigeria. So we also reported a case of uh, reinfection. We also described the case of reinfection that um, the first one we, did, we noticed was the one from Brazil, which was about a nine months uh, gap. And then we saw uh, two cases of reinfection. Uh, there has been uh, two cases of reinfection, one with three months gap in between. And then the other one is about six months. Our own was about six months. And you can see the schematic showing within 97 days of the first episode being detected was of the strain of B11 and carries just one D614G mutation. And then when you see, if you see uh, from the other side, you will see that the other one has B1110 and then has three different mutations, uh, 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 L452R uh, and then the D614G mutation, you know, which, which also drove the first wave. These were what we saw in, the, in that mutation. So this is really our story about the sequencing so far in Nigeria. And we hope that uh, other people will be able to also uh, uh, have more of their sequences deposited and we, as we try to drive our own. Thank you so much. And these are our partners and the people we are working together. Thank you. Thank so you so much, Dr. Dodo, for that eloquent presentation. Uh, and I understand that uh, we are above time. And I'll just open up now for five minutes if you can answer a few questions. And the first one I see here is if, uh, what is the maximum CT to be considered positive and what uh, CT value level uh, qualify the sequencing for, for sequencing? Okay, thank you so much. That's a very, very, very important question. So we have seen that actually we set our target from uh, le uh, CT less than 27. We have seen that anything above 30 assembly is very, very weak. We, we, don't, we don't have very good assembly. So we work between uh, CT less than 27 now. Is that the same you use for routine diagnosis then? Not really. So we can, uh, sometimes we can detect um, from, depending on the outcome, the, the cutoff of the kit we have used, because we're using quite a lot of kits. Some are less than 36, some are above 40. If you're using genus part, you usually set the cutoff above 40 or so. You know, so depending on that, so but for our sequencing, we usually see that cities uh, below 26 usually work fine for sequencing. Uh, below 27 usually work fine for sequencing. You know, that there's a particular case we have right now we want to sequence. This is a case of um, uh, post-vaccination um, positivity. So uh, we are trying to uh, uh, do sequencing concern on that one recent now, but the CT was very high. It's about 40 CT, uh, you know, so we, we, and we cannot really do um, sequencing with that. So we are trying to sequence the two, three, two, the person had been reinfected, been infected like two, three times. So we want to do, look at the sequence, those two, two, time, uh, two samples already, where the CTs are low. Last question. Hello, I can hear you. Sorry, I said we will not take all the others. We'll just take this last question. And uh, the question is about how best is the Sangha sequencing platform for dealing with a highly variable virus like SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, we are. We have actually seen that the, the each each of the technology has its own uh, strength. You know. Since we are interested in some, uh, particularly you can, you, with Sanger sequencing, you are not, it takes a lot of work and it's very expensive to do a whole genome sequencing. We have seen a couple of whole genome sequencing done using Sanger, sequence, uh, Sanger sequencers, you know, but the benefit is maybe targeting, doing a more targeted approach. Maybe you are sequencing some, uh, maybe the spike proteins as we can see the envelope or any, other, any of those ones. So those can be very, very informative. And uh, it's also the approach. 
I've seen some people who believe that you, you don't really need too much uh, the whole of the 29,000 genome for, to, 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 to really make a good um, impact. We can really have a targeted app, you know, use Sangha to do some, some few uh, interesting uh, regions. So that, that can be very productive too. Okay, Dr. Dodo, I think the question was also asking if you could bring you good results and which particular genes should be targeted by Sangha sequencing. Yeah, that, like I just said, it can bring good results. Like I've seen some people, particularly people in Myanmar, they have really used the Sangha sequencers as sequencing to do some the whole genome sequencing. But many of them, they target the spike proteins. And some also look at the non-structural proteins too. You know, so, but you can look at the spike proteins where they are, the receptor binding domains where uh, everybody is looking at for the vaccine efficacy. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And uh, please uh, join me to thank all of the presenters. We've heard a very enriching uh, uh, you know, presentation from Dr. Dodo about the, uh, the current variants. I know that his last slide about the curve was a little misleading to me to think that there may be no coronavirus is detected this month of June. But I think that we can have that discussion going on out of this platform. And uh, because uh, we are out of time, I want to again thank the Global Health Network to, for providing this platform. I want to be very, very cognizant of you, the participants, for your very interactive uh, uh, participation. And of course, again, a big applause to all our uh, chairs for a great job. Well done. Thank you so much. And hopefully we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.